Okay, I would like to call this meeting of the Monroe County Council to order for Tuesday, whatever, August 23rd. Um, welcome everyone. Um, it looks like we have a full slate of council members um, in here present in the room for the work session. Um, according to this, I do not have to have you call roll, but I kind of think it's fun. So I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, Councilor Deckard. Here. Councilor Munson. Here. Councilor Presley. Here. Councilor McKim. Here. Councilor Hawk. Here. Councilor Iverson. Here. Yay, we're all here. Um, that brings us to the adoption of the agenda. Does anyone wish to change or add or uh, remove any items from tonight's agenda? Yes, uh, Council, I move that we uh, move item eight. eight uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, move item nine, highway department to item 4C. It's, yeah, that would need a second. Okay, I'll uh, second that. Can you read that? I didn't, I didn't catch all that. Sorry, time. moving uh, item nine, highway department, uh, to item to 4C to handle it after the boards of commissions. And, and could we uh, add to that adding 14 onto there as well? Because that's housekeeping. And that should be a one and done. Uh, Ms. Sharp won't be with us this evening. We could just. It's just a okay. I would include fourteen after four, uh, after nine. I, I I'm sorry. I'm not hearing anything that you got here saying. Okay. The motion is to move item nine highway department and fourteen assessor to four C and D. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, I think we can do a voice vote. Um, all those in favor of uh, changing or amending the agenda as indicated in the motion say aye. 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 Um, aye. Those say nay. Okay. We are amended. Now we have, great. now we are moving to Department updates, which is number three on our agenda. Do we have any departments that would like to make an update? Great. Welcome, Ms. Purdy. Good evening. You guys all look just fabulous. Okay. Very handsome and beautiful. Um, I am only here to let you guys know that I am working on a PowerPoint um, for the 2022 general obligation bond. And I'm actually going to send you one uh, as soon as I finish up here, actually, so you'll have it in your inbox. Um, or I, what I might actually do is put it in Dropbox for, for you guys. That might be the easier way to, to address that issue. So I'll put it in Dropbox for you and um, just you know, ask you to have a look at it. And I believe we plan on coming at the next work session or the next the regular work session. The work session. So, and then if you guys have any concerns or questions between now and that time, don't hesitate to reach out to me. So, great, thank so, you. That's all I have. Thank Terrific. you. Are there any other departments who would like to make updates? I would like to make an update. Um, okay, For, we had Bree beat you to raise in the hand. Okay. So we'll go with the auditor's department and Bree. Sure. Hey guys, good good afternoon. Uh, so Kathy Smith, the Monroe County Auditor and the brainchild of our department, Bree, uh, our financial director. So a couple things. Uh, we wanted to, um, as you prepare for your budgets, we kind of wanted to touch base with you. Um, Bree and Kim have worked with putting the um, the revenues in Gateway. I checked them yesterday. I think there might've been one correction, maybe a couple times, one real correction, one small correction. Um, but other than I'll say a very tiny amount with lit in the general fund. Um, and I mean, very, very tiny amount. Um, everything is in there. 
perfect and, and well. So if you would like to look at those, what those, um, what those projected um, revenues are going to be, they're in there for you. If you have any trouble uh, accessing your gateway or you want any help looking at it, then of course we will help you. Um, we will help you do that. Uh, so that is the beginning of the budget is looking at the available amount of money before we start looking at expenses. Now tomorrow, the county council um, it is the date that we have set forth uh, via the county council and Kim's, Kim's um, sent out the email uh, to ask the departments to have their um, budgets completed. So if we get them by the end of the day tomorrow, that we get them all, because there are some um, people who um, don't have theirs completed, um, as I just found out just a second ago, uh, we'll, we will um, look at them at the end of the day or maybe the beginning of the next day, which is Thursday. And by Friday, I think we'll have um, sorted through them all. Kim, does that sound right to you? By Friday, we'll have sorted through them all and we'll have a good picture of what the asks are for the county. So then you'll have your revenue and you'll have your proposed expenses. And then we can start marrying things together in some quasi form of a budget. Um, realizing that there are still a lot of questions that have to be answered, um, like new positions, like we're gonna talk about a couple new positions tonight and, um, and you know larger ticket asks and those kind of things. But the substantial asks will be in the computer and they will be in loud, which is different than gateway. So how it's going to work is sort of what I wanna to explain to you tonight is instead of using custom spreadsheets, we're using the LAO financial interface called the budget module. We have asked each department uh, to put in their asks in this budget module. Then once, um, once they do that and it gets vetted through um, Kim and Bree and, and, and checked and I'll go over and check it too. Um, then it becomes sort of the, the blanket ask to the county council. Then once it becomes a blank and ask, you guys can look at it. But when we start the budget hearings, it will go from the asking module to the budget hearing module. It'll, it's like a second part of a module. And so it will look very much like the spreadsheets that you guys are used to receiving. And at that time, um, it real time through the budget hearings, we can make changes and, um, and it will change the subcategory totals and category totals. And of course the composite total as well. So um, it will look different. They will not be regular spreadsheets. Um, and the spreadsheets that we will be using moving forward are, are simple one layer, what I call one layer spreadsheets. They're not hierarchical spreadsheets or hier hierarchical databases you know, integrated together. They're just gonna be flat files of numbers. Like, um, like for instance, um, the, um, the, 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 what do you call the salary grid? The salary, different salary grids. Each salary grid will be their own and it will have built-in um, parameters, built-in formulas, but they won't build upon each other to where there's multiple layers and one affects you know, 20 different spreadsheets or whatever. So we wanna keep flat files. Um, and when I call those spreadsheets, I, I consider those more of accumulated data, right? You know, forms or datas or, or, um, or uh, acquisition fields. When I talk about the database, it will be, we will talk about solely about LAO being the database, integrates into our financials, it's part of our financials. And then, um, then we'll talk about the state's database, which is uh, Gateway, which we funnel things into Gateway to report to the state. So once you guys make up your minds of what you want to, for the budget, then we will enter it into Gateway and, it, and that is at the state level. And so, there, so there's the local level, which will be LAO, and the state level, which will be Gateway. Um, and as we move forward and we look at um, the, 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 we'll say the things that are still hanging out there that you could or could not change, um, such as, um, such as uh, um, COLA, for instance, right? Um, you know, we, we, we want you to understand the budget projection first, and we want, it, want you to understand the method that we're doing it. Then we want you to understand the variables. So the variables that we, we believe 
that you have asked us for, which is a 5% for COLA. Um, we know that that can change. And sometimes that changes at the end. Last year, we had rankings that changed. We had to adopt the WIS study. There was many, many attributes that changed late in the game last year. And because of that, because we didn't have that structure, we did not implement um, the, the, um, the Lao project last year, but we are fully implementing it this year. Um, so, so one thing, so a couple of things that I want to mention is as you consider COLA, um, there are some variables that you may or may not want to adopt, uh, or you may not want, you may or may not want to consider, but I want to mention them to you so that they're on your radar. The first thing being that edit hits our county's payroll October 1. So October 1, the every employee across the county that lives in Monroe County will have a decrease of almost 7% in their paycheck, 0.7% um, in their paycheck. I said seven, but you know, I meant 0. 0.7, 700 basis points, 0. 0.7. Okay, so once, once that hits, then they, then of course that affects the raises that we received last year because the money goes right back basically to the county in a lot of situations. Sometimes it goes to the city. But in addition to that, there's an increase in health insurance by 2.8%. So, so when you basically add those together, it, it's a significant um, real decrease of salary. So as you think about 5% or 6% or whatever, you, you know, all the way up to, you know, like milk has doubled, I about, had a cow paying $4.50 for a gallon of milk a couple of days ago. Um, as you consider these things, please know that that's what are on employees' minds. Those are the build phone calls we're fielding. How much is insurance going up and how much is, when, when does this kick in? I'm understanding from my wife, my husband, my friend that we're gonna lose money starting October 1st. So we're seeing lots of these phone calls. So, so in doing that, We've had a lot of discussion over the past really year and a half about retaining employees um, in key jobs and also in just even entry level jobs, retaining employees. And so there is eligible expenses for that through ARPA. And, it, and I sent you or I brought you information because I didn't want to ask him for one more thing. I know she had sent so many things out and I didn't want to bug her on council day. So I just went ahead and made old fashioned Xeroxes. So please forgive me for killing these trees. There are two, two uh, printouts. One is authorized um, retention incentives um, from ARPA, and then a project example of just what somebody did. Um, obviously, you can see on here that, um, that there are many different ways you can use ARPA money to help employees, but because we've talked so much about retaining employees and trying to keep, Bloomington is an expensive place to live, and it's very competitive. It, you know, we, we lose people, it seems like pretty much weekly. Like I know we just lost a key employee out of, um, out of uh, youth services. And so every time we lose somebody, there's an expense associated with that for the learning curve and the, the time to take them, the time it takes for the next person to get above, you know, to that per other person's level of expertise. There's an expense associated with that that's really hard to capture. So I did want you to know that we do have these ARPA funds. They are significant. There is a mechanism to use some of this ARPA money for retention of employees. Um, I think it's up to 10% uh, across the board, and there's sometimes it's up to 25%, depending on uh, what it is. Um, so, uh, so I think... Um, I think I sort of covered the nutshell version. Later in the program, I'm, or later in the meeting, I'm going to have a, an agenda item. I don't want to talk about that now, uh, but um, but I want to see if you guys have any questions or if Bree wants to comment on these department updates. I covered a lot in a short period of time. Sure, um, I just want to add as far as the budget this year, um, just. Uh, please be patient and work with us as we work, you know, implementing this new piece of the software we've had for a while. Um, I think it's going to be great. It's definitely best practice to be using it rather than using, you know, tools we're inventing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think you're going to like it. And I think once you're used to it, it the information will be great, um, you know, just as wonderful mm -hmm. as Kim's spreadsheets were in the past. So, um, please feel free to contact me anytime or ask any questions. Of course, Michelle is available as well, but um, just reach out anytime. And as far as the gateway information, um, if you're looking at those forms, so what has been 
um, populated currently, we have um, the current year financial worksheets completed. So that gives you like your June 30th cash balance, um, projected expenditures, that sort of thing. And then also the miscellaneous revenue and the debt section has also been populated with our estimates. So, um, so what you're missing then from, I know you like to see the 4B is just the budgetary information, which is not available yet, okay? I so. will say we've been very pleased with the revenues and very pleased with the projected revenues as well. I know last year we were sort of concerned that we'd be sitting here tonight worried about those things, but that has not come to fruition. Do you agree? And I, I think uh, the revenues are looking wonderful. <laughs> so it's a good thing. That's good news, right? It's very good news. Thank you. Um, before you, are there any questions for the auditor? Oh, oh all oh, right. Oh, I do have one. Previously, when we used spreadsheets uh, at budget hearings, uh, we were able to study uh, the budgets uh, before the hearings began and could make notes in our very own copy of the spreadsheets um, for questions for particular departments, et cetera. Is this going to be feasible for us? Can we download what's coming from Lao onto our computers? Can we? Uh, write some notes to ourselves. Uh, you can export all of this to um, yeah. to uh, various spreadsheets. You, I don't know which spreadsheet you're used to using, but um, well, in, what, in I'm the just past saying, what, we've used Microsoft products. You can yeah. download it to the various products and you know put your notes in there. Yeah, we'll be happy to help you do that. Yeah, definitely, we can export so you can have your own personal copy um, to watch the live updates. So. Great. Thanks. That would be fantastic. And I mean, if there are specific steps that aren't obvious, maybe we could work with you. Oh, to we'll do that for you. And okay, <laughs> you're right. Great. Because <laughs> that was my question too. I was yeah. just like writing that down for later. Well, the product is scalable and adaptable. So yeah. I have. Wonderful. I've. I mean, I know it's intimidating to some people, but once once we sort of get the model going, yeah. and wish and you guys get familiar with it, I think you'll love it. Great. I, I would like to make one comment before somebody else. Um, I do know that when we do download it into Excel, um, I, and I know that uh, the council is used to being able to see a live update and we immediately have all this. Well, uh, loud does not uh, automatically uh, fix if, let's just say if there is a salary change, it does not automatically fix like the perf and the retirement. So those things will not be able to do on the fly. We'll have okay. to come back at the next meeting, fix and give you updates of what the new totals will be. Okay. So okay. you'll have a good idea, but it won't be complete at that point. So, but that's one of the drawbacks mm -hmm. of using loud, but I really like it. And I think, I think it's going to work really well for Thank you. The, um, the, the benefits are percentage. So like if you said, well, what exactly would that be? We could just say, sure. multiply it out for you and say, yeah. oh, it's going to be this. And yeah. we mm -hmm. could even hand key it in if we want to do it at that time. But it doesn't mm -hmm. do it like we have some, we have specialty grids. So therefore, you know, we have to add some um, intuitiveness into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when would be, and maybe it was a part of this discussion and I was missing it. But I'm just so anxious to see what, what each department has asked for so that we can live, you know, go sure. line by line and say, well, what didn't they spend this year? What, what could we Okay, well, they're tomorrow? due tomorrow evening. They're due tomorrow at the end of day. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kim. That's correct. And then I would like a day or two days for Kim and I and Bree to look through them. I think Kim will have the initial look to see did anybody not turn theirs in, and then um, and then as they get as they're definitely turned in and, and populated correctly, then um, you know she can't do everything at once. We're going to work try to assist as best we can to look at them. So I would say by Friday would over the weekend be okay with you. I'm be happy to get it whenever I just I would hope that we don't wait until we're going into budget workshops. No, it. it'll be this week. Because <clears throat> that's just not. It's and like if you want to come in, Marty, this week, like say Thursday or Friday, we'll show you how to use Lao. We, no, we, it's right, easy. Because, it's pretty easy to use, I think. I'm or we can print to, it out to you and just give you a hard copy. Like I'm ready to learn. So, so. 
Um, just to clarify, we'll at least um, give you a really good update on Friday as to where we are with the budgets. And if we are able to, we'll, we will get those out. We would love to be able to. It's dependent upon information received. So if that makes sense. We, we have a little bit of time before budget workshops. So I have, I have a question. Uh, Kathy, did you um, make your uh, pitch for the uh, retention bonuses out of ARPA to the commissioners yet? Because anything has to happen, you know, and anything that's spent out of ARPA has to be in the commissioner's plan. And, you know, they, they in their 144 is recommended. Well, I'm not sure point. that you guys even are even interested okay. in it. But, you know, it's something that we could do if you guys are interested. You may have a whole nother plan. I'm just showing it to you as an option of something that could possibly develop. I'm not saying it's the way to go or not the way to go. Okay. That's your guys' call, not my call. I don't care. I'm just how you saying that it. it has to be in the in the plan before. Yeah, we're able yeah, to and it, I think the plan's kind of still developing. I'm not sure, but you, you know, whatever you guys work out with the commissioners, we're happy to do. We're happy to help in any way that we can help. Absolutely. We just want to make sure that you understand there's, you know, what the choices are. Does that make sense? We know you're working so closely uh, together, and um, you know, it's a, a group project. So absolutely, we can we'll bring this to their attention as well. Would, yeah. um, if we were, to, if the commissioners did think that would be possible, would we do it like in the form of a bonus over so many years? I don't know how they would want to do well, because it. Because it wouldn't sustain itself. Because but, it but I am assured that the commissioners would like to see more than 5%. And so they probably discussed that with you. I'm not sure exactly when that happened or how they presented that, but I'm under, I, I am under the understanding that it has been presented more. Um, than the than the five percent that you guys ask us ask uh, we, we ask departments to put in, and um, and you know the the issue is the issue is we worked so hard to get everybody's salary last year to the point that you guys were happy with, with the exception of elected officials. I think we did a pretty damn good job. I really do. It was a lot of hard work. Everybody pitched in. I'm very proud of the work that we did because ten years ago when we did it, we didn't implement it. So I just want to make sure that you guys understand that if we if we don't keep up with it, then we do head backwards. I don't want to take money that's promised to some other project. You know, it's not for me to pick the budgets. It's for you guys. It's for me to say, this is what's on the table. It could be done. How do you want to do it? So I'm not going to usurp your guys' authority in any stretch of the imagination. Um, I just wanted to mention about the the um, lit because we're hearing from employees about it, of course, and uh, and insurance will go up. You know, the we actually had a couple good years where where I felt like not only did our salaries get closer to where they should be or where they should be, but we've also had flat insurance, which is amazing, which is absolutely amazing. And so, um, so it's not all like a like in the doldrums. I mean, some of it's really good things, and having good cash is a wonderful thing. So I'm here to assist you in any way that you guys need help. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Michelle, you had another item. Yes, I'm, I just wanted to take a moment and introduce our uh, new administrative assistant, uh, Courtney Mosier. <laughs> and um, uh, she will be working in the council office um, Tuesdays through Friday, eight to four. So uh, she does classes at Ivy Tech. And on Mondays, um, she has to be there, but uh, she's gonna be working with us Tuesdays through Friday. So uh, don't scare her and overwhelm her yet. So if you, <laughs> let's just break her in slowly. And, and uh, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited that she's here, so. Fantastic, it's great to have you. Nice to meet you too. Are there any other departments who have updates for us? Okay, seeing none there, um, we'll move to 4A, um, Board and Commission's appointments. And um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the receipt of Sean Hanlon's resignation um, as our council appointment to the Convention and Visitors Commission. Um, on behalf of the council, I would like to thank Sean for 11 years of service. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to the CDC and wish him well in his new position, uh, which I understand is the new manager of the Indiana Memorial Union Biddle Hotel. So we're not, mm -hmm. we're not seeing him go too far away. So that's fantastic. Um, but we do have um, a replacement, is that correct? That is correct, yes. And um, for the record, um, uh, Kirby Brown uh, has submitted an application and um, I think, uh, you want me to talk about uh, Mr. Brown, uh, the, the qualifications or, or Ms. Um, excuse me, um, about qualifications or um, uh, how, would, how would you like to proceed here? Is there a we motion? Have, we have a copy of the application um, in our packet yeah. and um, is there a motion? I do. Okay. I've got a motion, Madam President. Council, I move to approve the recommendation to appoint Kirby Brown to the Convention and Visitors Commission, completing a two-year term that expires on December 31st, 2022. Second. Fantastic. So are there any um, comments now? Okay. Okay. The only comment I would have is, and it may just be a, a sort of a, the statement here on on what it's saying that it's a citizen member appointment and it, this really is that's not what this is that this is an appointment by the county council and it must two of those appointments must be um, either the owner or the general manager of at least a 40 bed uh, unit here in the county so um, i think we should not call it a citizen appointment because that's not what it's it is. Not. And I, I don't think you said that. It's just here on. Yes. On. And so I just wanted to get that corrected so that no one will think, well, it's just, we can just appoint a citizen. It's true. This does come with some pretty specific right. requirements. And that's why I sent that email right. to you. Yeah. I had that concern. And I thought it was Kirby. I, I thought it was a lady. Is it a gentleman? Is the is mm -hmm. name Kirk or what's the name? The name is Kirby. I I put Kirk. That was the typo on my end. I correct. Okay. He said it correctly. Yeah. And the, the motion did not have a reference to citizen. Great. Go ahead. If if I could, in, in the in the packet, uh, this person has come to us with 21 years of experience as a general manager over multiple different uh, styles and types of properties in multiple markets, including Fishers, downtown Indianapolis, Muncie and eight years here in downtown Bloomington. So I, I think I'm really excited about uh, uh, this. And uh, I see uh, Mike Campbell is in the audience too. And I think we're all pretty excited about this appointment. Great, I have one more comment. That's um, I just wish that this uh, particular person lived here in Monroe County. She's not, a, does not live in Monroe County. And so since it's so essential to Monroe County, it would have been nice had we been able to find someone who actually lived here, who also was the owner or general manager. And that might just have been impossible to find. But I mean, this is, this is such an important position. And so I, I just could not let that go without stating uh, that uh, it would be nice to have, have them here, living here. <laughs> Are there any other comments from council members? Oh. I would note for um, the discussion that I looked at the statute for the convention and visitor commissions um, creation and membership, and there isn't a residency requirement. Great, thank you. I'm not saying it was required. I'm just saying it would be, be nice. <laughs> yes. Okay. Noted. Noted. I feel pretty um, pretty lucky to have a really qualified person um, yes. willing to step in and serve because this is a, an important role. So um, many thanks to Mr. Brown. Um, any other comments or questions from council? Okay, then we should have a vote and I believe um, we can, can we do a voice vote since we're all here? No. Yay. No. no? I think it's, this is important. We should. Okay, it. we are going to, at the request of Councillor Hawk, 
do the roll call vote, please. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wilts? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Um, now we move to item 4B. I believe, yes. Madam President, it's you actually going to be 4C, mm -hmm. which is the old oh, I. Oh, yes. My apologies. 4C. So um, 4C is number nine? Yes. <laughs> yes. And I've got a motion. Playing along at home. <laughs> <laughs> it's like bingo. Council, I move to approve the highway department's request for an additional appropriation in fund 11760531 motor vehicle highway maintenance and repair in the amount of $149,500 in the supplies category. Second. And we have Lisa Rich here to talk to us about this. Welcome. Good evening. Um, so we did receive, um, the auditor's office receded in the $149,500 from NDOT. That's the community crossings match from the January call uh, for the paving of Rockport Road. So we just need to put that into the bituminous line so we can pay for it. This seems very straightforward. Are there any comments or questions from council? Just the comment I'd like to make is that uh, on some of the information we received from the state, uh, there's the thought that because the sales tax went up, we might lose money for the highway having to do with the gas tax, but because the sales tax is, is figured differently, we might have more money for the community crossing. So I think it's essential that we keep looking at our match dollars so that we can continue if we have the opportunity, because not every county is going to, going to be able to come up with matching dollars. That is correct. That's our understanding. We've already sent in for the July call. Actually, they had extended it to August 31st. Um, so you're allowed to be awarded up to $1 million of those matching funds. So the first round, we were given this 149.5. So we went ahead and we submitted for 1.6 million worth of projects. So the other 850,000. Uh, that we would be um, able to receive if awarded. So we've already sent in that. Um, so they'll announce those probably around in October. Fantastic. Any other comments or questions? Yes. I just, on behalf of my neighbors, near neighbors who live along South Rockport Road, a huge thank you. Uh, this long awaited paving is much appreciated and I know the challenges we have in, in having funding for paving in the county and that you study uh, which roads need it the most. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Any other council comment? Are, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, could I have a roll call vote please? Councillor Decker? Yes. Councillor Wilts? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Okay, so now we're going to 4D, which is originally 14. Is that correct? I think we've got 9B. We have nine, nine B. We got a 9B that's now 4 something. <laughs> And I've got a motion. <laughs> Council, I move to approve the highway department's request for an additional appropriation in fund 11350000 cumulative bridge in the amount of $600,000 in the services category. Second. Welcome back. <laughs> I say to Thanks. you and me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is for our Bells Road Bridge. It's actually three pipes that we're placing with one bridge. Uh, we anticipate it to go to letting. Um, this December for a construction season of 2023. So we wanted to um, add the additional funds to that project line uh, before it goes to letting. Okay. And are there questions or comments from council? No? no. Any public comments on this item? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote? 
Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Decker? Yes. Councillor Wilkes? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're not, uh, yeah, everyone's helping me out now because they've right. seen that I'm completely confused. <laughs> we're on item 14 on the agenda, which has been moved up to somewhere in number four. Council, I move to approve the assessor's request for a category transfer in fund 12240000 reassessment of $2,000 from the services category to the supply category. Second. Okay, um, could I speak to that? You, I, you may. Right. I know Michelle was going to talk I'm as well. Liaison okay, sure, program. certainly. Um, a little background on this. This is a, a car that they were uh, surprised with, and they told they were told they were going to be receiving this, and that was a year ago. It took nearly a year for this car to get in place. Um, and what they do, what they had normally done is they've used their own vehicles, uh, but now they will be using this county vehicle and they will be filling up at, at the highway garage. Uh, but when they are out on a, any kind of out of town mission, then this would give them the ability to use their credit card for gas like if they're on a conference or something, and by the way, they're getting ready to go on a conference. So that's the reason why we wanted to get this in place now, but it really is just housekeeping. Okay, uh, thank you. Kim, did you need to add anything to that? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sharp has asked me to do it, but she just- Yeah, seems pretty straightforward. Are there any questions or comments from counselor? Um, okay. Any public comments on this item? All right, so I believe we can do a voice vote since it's just a fund to fund transfer. Um, so all those in favor of approving the assessor's category transfer, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion passes. <clears throat> do we need to also create the new account line or did that get that done as well? No account line being 201 fuel. Sorry, what was that? Do we also need to move on creating the account line or did we? It was all encompassed in the motion. Okay, thank you. We will now move back to item five which is a departmental report from the sheriff's office um, per Indiana code 36-8-10-21E. The sheriff is to provide a semi-annual commissary report to council. Want to acknowledge that for the record, the council has received a copy of the 2022 January through June commissary fund report. Are there any comments from council on this item? Since this is just an acknowledgement of receipt, that is completed. We acknowledge. All right, thank you. Um, our next item is uh, item number six from the legal department. Um, this is a, uh, an, a second reading of an ordinance to um, approve and fix terms and conditions for the purchase of land. However, um, I would like to table this. Do we need to have the motion read first? I think that's what Jeff had suggested since it had already gotten <clears throat> first reading to, to read it and then somebody can make a motion. Okay. okay. So I will do the introductory motion and the resolution reading and then, okay. Uh, council, I move to approve ordinance 2022-24, an ordinance to approve and fix terms and conditions for the purchase of land. Ordinance 2022-24, an ordinance to approve and fix terms and conditions 
for the purchase of land, whereas pursuant to the authority granted to the Monroe County Council by the General Assembly of the State of Indiana under IC 36-2-2-20, the council, a conveyance or purchase by county of land having a value of $1,000 or more must be authorized by an ordinance of the county fiscal body fixing the terms and conditions of the transaction. And whereas the Monroe County Board of Commissioners intend to purchase land from the Bill C. Brown revocable trust under certain terms, which are described in the attached and incorporated contract for purchase of real estate marked as exhibit one. And whereas exhibit one indicates a purchase pr price of $10,020,000, the agreement requires council approve, approval pursuant to IC, IC 36-1-10.5-5 and IC-36-2-2-20 now therefore be it ordained and established by the Monroe County Council as follows. Section one, the Monroe County Council has been provided an appraisal for the property owned by the Bill C. Brown Revocable Trust and described in exhibit one. Section two, council wishes for the Monroe, for Monroe County to acquire the property owned by seller and described in exhibit one. As the fiscal body for Monroe County, this ordinance serves as expression of the council's interest in purchasing the land as required by IC 36-1-10.5-5. And per section three, per IC 36-2-2-20, the council approves of all the terms and conditions described in the contract for purchase of real estate, which is attached here to as exhibit one. The council recognizes that the purchase agreement requires a second appraisal of the property and the total price may not exceed the average of two of the appraisals received by the council. Section four, to the extent council approval is required, the council approves the execution and deliverance of any and all documents necessary to approve the contract for purchase of real estate and authorizes officers of the county to take any and all action necessary to ratify, approve, or finalize the transaction. Ordinance 2022-24 is hereby presented to the Monroe County Council of Indiana, read in full for adoption this 23rd day of August, 2022. Second and council, I move that we table this item to the uh, September 13th uh, regular session of the Monroe County Council. Second. We've had a motion to table and um, as a point of explanation, this was a request from um, Jeff Cockrell, our our council handling this deal, this deal, excuse me, this land transaction. Um, it was brought to his attention that there were just some details that he needed to edit in the document to which we're referring. So um, we're tabling it, giving him time to make those edits and changes, and mm -hmm. um, we will take a look at it when it's ready for us. Are there any questions or further comment? I think, I think once we've said we're going to table, we aren't allowed. To, oh, okay, about but, the tabling. But, but whatever, at any rate, I will just say that I appreciate County Legal taking a, a last minute call from me and saying, look, I have some concerns and they're looking at it and something I think can be looked out. Uh, in my background in real estate, I just can't not say something if I see something. Mm -hmm. so, but I appreciate their being willing to hear me. Okay. Um, any comments or questions about the tabling? Comment, yes. please. Yes. Uh, about the tabling? Yeah, about the tabling. Yeah. But, but it's that in order to discuss the we do That's not need to, to discuss this since we're talking about tabling. Okay. So I'm going to just go ahead and do a voice vote then for um, tabling this agenda item. All in favor, favor of tabling to our next regular session meeting on the 13th of September, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes, the item is tabled which brings us to item number seven on the agenda, which is the Friends of Lake Monroe. 
Um, it looks like we're going to have a presentation from Maggie Sullivan. It's good to see you again. Um, and she'll be updating us on watershed management that is um, in place for protecting Lake Monroe. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I have a PowerPoint slide that I think they're going to load here, but my name is Maggie Sullivan. I am with Friends of Lake Monroe. I am the watershed coordinator for the lake. And uh, we recently finished a watershed management plan. So I wanna talk about that today. Next slide. We've been working on this for about two and a half years. I'm sure you're all familiar with the lake, but just as a reminder, next. We may think of it as our prime recreational destination, but it's also our source of drinking water for over 130,000 people. It's the home to wildlife like bald eagles. And it was originally constructed primarily for flood control on the White River, which is something we don't always think about here. Next slide. We received a grant in 2019 and have been working on this for about two and a half years. Um, nice, thank you to Cheryl Munson for serving on our steering committee. Uh, we had representatives from about 20 different organizations guiding the process. And the whole idea was to study the lake and its watershed. Next slide. This is a map of the Lake Monroe watershed. It's about 440 square miles. Next, there's three tributaries, North Fork Salt Creek, Middle Fork Salt Creek and South Fork Salt Creek, very creative names. Next, you can see about 20% of the watershed is in Monroe County, about 50% in Brown and about 20% in Jackson. Next slide. We're very proud that we had a lot of community participation in developing this plan. Uh, we held community forums, we gave presentations in schools and to any group that would listen to us. We recruited volunteers to help with our sampling and we held a watershed tour. We also put up signs marking the boundary of the Lake Monroe watershed you might have seen driving around. Next. A lot of this was about data collection. We did quite a bit of water quality sampling. And when I say we, I mean the IU Limnology Lab. They went out and they sampled uh, four streams coming into the lake and one leaving monthly for a year. They sampled at three spots within the lake monthly for six months. And then we sent volunteers out twice to sample 125 different locations to get a snapshot view of water quality. Next. We also went out and we took a look at streams in the watershed to try and get an idea. What's the land use? Are there stream bank erosion? And then we looked, this is specifically looking at riparian buffer, which is a fancy way of talking about the plants on the edge of the stream. What we don't wanna see is on the left where the land is tilled almost to the edge of the stream. There's really no protection between that bare land and the stream. Uh, the middle picture shows a grassy swale, which is a common conservation practice that the grass filters the runoff from the field and it stabilizes the stream bank with its roots. And on the right is what we most like to see, which is forested buffer. And those trees have the added benefit of shading the stream. Next. We also looked at lots of pretty maps and you can see from this one, our watershed is heavily forested over 80%, which is unusual for Indiana. Next, part of that has to do with the topography. As you know, we are in a very hilly area. Next, and uh, in association with that, we have a lot of highly erodible soil. <laughs> uh, we think about mountains pushing up from the ground. In our area, the hills were formed by erosion, eroding the ground down. Next. We also have very limited sewer service in the watershed. We know the city of Bloomington is well serviced, but uh, in the watershed, there are few sewer services. So most people rely on septic systems. Next. We launched this with two community forums, one in Bloomington and one in Nashville. We've had about hundred people come out and we asked, what are your concerns about the lake? And this word bubble says some of the things people talked about, E. coli, sedimentation, drinking water, algal blooms, but we took all these concerns and we compared them to the data that we collected. Next, we identified the top threats as being sediment, nutrients, and E. coli. Next. So sediment, next. The big concern with sediment, the sediment itself is a concern, but it also carries things with it. Uh, and in this particular case, we're most concerned about nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Next. There are many different potential sources of sediment. I mentioned stream bank erosion. You also have probably seen lakeshore erosion out at the lake where there's heavy livestock use, the soil can get churned up or where the soil is tilled for farming. Also development, you see a lot of bare soil and sometimes during timber harvest, basically anywhere the soil is exposed, it can get washed into our stream. Next, 
Um, the sediment load is very variable when we look at the streams, what's coming into the lake. Uh, and this is not unexpected. There's some studies that say over 80% of the annual load can come in the five biggest rainstorms of the year. And so when there's a heavy rain, we see a lot of sediment moving. Next, we looked at our data to calculate the annual load, what's coming into the lake, what's going out. And again, not surprisingly, we saw about 92% of the sediment is stored. So about 36,000 tons per year of sediment are stored in the bottom of Lake Monroe. Next, nutrients. Our big concern with nutrients is they can stimulate harmful algal blooms. Uh, those can have a health impact, they can produce toxins, but even when they don't, uh, it makes recreation less desirable and it also complicates drinking water treatment. I think we can all remember some taste issues at different times and that's a hard thing to deal with. Next. There are many potential sources of nutrients. I already mentioned it can be carried with sediment. Uh, it can also come in with any kind of manure, whether that's animal manure or human manure from leaking septic systems. And then of course, fertilizer, whether that's on the farm, that's at home or on a commercial property. Next. When we look at phosphorus in Lake Monroe, we saw that almost 90% of the hypolimnion samples, that's the deeper part of the water, were over our target. And about a quarter of the epilimnion, the more surface water were. So we definitely have an excess of nutrients. Uh, you'll notice those biggest spikes are down at the bottom of the lake in the deepest areas. And that indicates we're actually getting some phosphorus released from the sediment. So it's been accumulating since the lake was built in 1964. And when the conditions are right in the summer, those nutrients are released. And that's important to keep in mind because even if we uh, eliminate all the sources of nutrients from the watershed, it may take a while for the lake to work through what's already stored in the sediment. Next. When we look at the tributaries, we saw that many of the samples were over our target. So it's coming in from all the tributaries pretty consistently. Next, E. coli. So E. coli indicates fecal contamination, also known as poop. E. coli itself is generally not harmful, but there are other pathogens present that we need to be concerned with. So when E. coli levels are elevated, we need to limit recreation to avoid it. health impacts. Next. Um, Fecal contamination is generally either animals or humans. It could be pets, livestock, leaking septic systems, or wildlife. The two that we've really honed in on are wildlife and septic systems. We estimate there are about 9,000 septic systems in the watershed, and probably around half of those are over 30 years old. Uh, and we know there are quite a few livestock. Uh, about 20% of the stream crossings we visited had livestock present. Next. And when we look at our data and where we saw elevated levels of E. coli, it's pretty well distributed throughout the watershed. We were kind of hoping that there might be one area that was clearly the issue, but it seems to be a widespread concern. Next. So we took all our data, calculated what's our current load, what target load do we wanna see, what kind of reduction do we need? And they're pretty significant. We wanna see an 80% reduction in phosphorus, 20 41% in sediment, 20% in nitrogen, and about 45% in E. coli. Next. So in order to do that, we developed an action plan. Uh, and that addresses the source of pollution in the watershed, so keeping it where it is and preventing it from getting into our streams. And um, we'll be able to measure progress by uh, calculating how many acres we've impacted and then running models to see how many tons of sediment or pounds of phosphorus do we keep out. And that was a pretty picture of someone planting a tree. I'm not sure why it didn't come through. Next. So our action plan will be voluntary. Uh, we I want to work with landowners willing to make changes. We do want to offer incentives such as a cost share program to help with that financial burden. And then a lot of education. So demonstration sites, work days, field days, uh, brochures, workshops, just getting the word out. Next. Some examples for livestock that's fencing animals out of streams and putting in heavy use area pads where they gather. Next for cropland that's low-till or no-till agriculture, planting cover crops after the main crop is harvested and those grassy strips we talked about. Next, uh, for forestry, there's best management practices on how to build trails and stream crossings focused on erosion control. Next, we already talked a little bit about riparian buffers and that's definitely something we wanna focus on. Next. We want to promote septic system maintenance. This is a, a big issue throughout the state and throughout the country. Next, uh, we're looking where there might be places to stabilize sections of lakeshore or streamshore where there's severe erosion. Next, and really educate. 
help people understand whether they're a homeowner, farmer, forester, even just a recreational visitor, they can make a difference with their actions. Next. We really feel that engaging community members is a key part of this process, getting them involved, whether that's doing fun things like boating or also fun things like picking up trash and sampling water. Next. And we know this is gonna require a lot of collaboration. This is a huge watershed. We're spanning multiple counties. We have a lot of state land, federal land. We have farmers, foresters, recreational users, conservationists, all these people and groups have a role to play. Next. So what happens next? We have our plan. And right now we are doing what we call our Lake Monroe Community Action Initiative, where we're spreading the word, telling people about the plan, uh, educating our community, we launched a pilot septic system maintenance cost share program where we gave people vouchers for half off the cost of getting their septic tank pumped as a reminder that that's something that people should be doing every three to five years. And we're also laying the groundwork for a conservation practice cost share program we hope to launch later this year. Next. So this fall, fingers crossed, we'll be getting another grant for a project of about $300,000 and the heart of that is a cost share program where we can go to interested landowners and say, we will help you pay for these practices because we know they protect water quality. We'll also be doing a lot of education, workshops, educational mailers to everyone in the watershed, and then some more fun interactive events. Next. And over the long term, we want to continue to build partnerships, find funding for these projects, and engage our community members, really educate, educate, educate. Next. Two specific things I wanna to talk to you about. We're having our first ever Lake Monroe Day on September 18th. So this is a chance to celebrate the lake. We have uh, asked for proclamations <laughs> from the mayor and from the county commissioners in Monroe and Brown counties. We will be having a small kayak tour. We're working with City of Bloomington Utilities on doing tours of the drinking water treatment plant. And we'll have a party in the evening at Upland Brewery. Next. We are also hosting a watershed summit on Saturday, October 22nd. And this is specifically for local leaders in all the three counties. We're hoping to get people together to start to talk about potential collaborations. So we are uh, extending the invitation. We'd love to see some of you there. And uh, we'll be sending out additional information on that as well. Next. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions, but really appreciate your support. Thank you. That was a lot of information. It and, was a lot. <laughs> and um, amazing, actually, the amount of work that's gone into this. I am really impressed. Um, but I'm going to turn it over. Council, are there any questions or comments, starting with Mr. Iverson? Again, thank you for being here. Uh, I have a statement and a question. First of all, thank you for highlighting the need for us to maintain a focus on septic. I think uh, alongside our health department here in Monroe County, we're very aware that there are a lot of systems out there that need a lot of attention. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, say that there are two projects in our uh, uh, American Recovery Plan uh, funds to address some septic issues, uh, not only on the cost side, but also on uh, giving our health department better uh, idea of where some of these uh, are and giving our staff better idea of, of how to locate some of these, these septic uh, fields uh, in areas that are maybe harder to reach and things like that. Sure. That's great. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how is climate change exasperating some of these problems? So I didn't go into detail on harmful algal blooms, but the three main things that impact them are nutrient levels, the temperature of the water, and how quickly the water is moving. So with climate change, what we're seeing in Indiana is we're getting a lot more rain in the winter and we're getting drier summers. So that means there are much better conditions for algal blooms because we've got these long summers that are dry, the water is getting warm, and it, there's not rain disturbing it and moving it. So, and that's makes it much more likely we'll be dealing with these on an increased uh, level. There are other implications to climate change as well, that heavier rains in the winter happen when the ground is most exposed, when there's the least vegetative cover. So you're also seeing an increase in sediment loss. And um, that's something that farmers are struggling with and really anywhere there's bare soil. Sure. Other comments? Where can we find more information about Lake Monroe Day? 
So we will be having more information about Lake Monroe Day on our website, which is friendsoflakemonroe.org. There is not much up there yet. Our, we're working on it right now. Uh, we'll be doing press releases as well and putting the word out on Facebook. I did want to mention I handed all of you a copy of our executive summary of the watershed plan. Uh, that electronic version is also available on our website for anyone interested. September 18th. September 18th. Sounds fun. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Decker. Thank you so much for being here. One question I had, and then I, I got, a, got a comment after your answer. What response are you getting from other counties or communities, particularly in the watershed? Any reactions or? Um, we've had a fair amount of engagement with Brown County. They're definitely interested. They realize even if they don't have quite the stake in Lake Monroe that we do, it's not their source of drinking water and they're maybe not recreating there as much. They want to protect their own streams and their own lakes. You know, uh, Sweetwater Lake is part of, of the watershed, Yellowwood Lake. And they also, they're dealing a lot with septic systems. That's an issue that's a hot topic in Brown County. So they see a lot of intersections there. We haven't made quite as many connections in Jackson County. That's been a little harder to reach. And with the pandemic, I haven't been shaking hands as much as I probably should have. So we are talking with the commissioners there and with the Soil and Water Conservation Office, and we're hoping to do uh, more work there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for all of this. And I think a sentiment of this council has very much been to be supportive and protective of the lake as much as we know how you've given us a lot more as part of that knowing um, but also kind of beating the drum in this community that a this is not just a natural lake that showed up one day um, <laughs> naturally and that b when things go into it it affects what you drink and what we use and our health and safety and the more I think we get that message out, I think the more reconsideration um, we have about something that I think sometimes people take for granted and also might take a little bit of advantage of. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Council Munson. It's been um, a true privilege to be able to work with Maggie Sullivan and others in the Friends of Lake Monroe on this project. And I just want to take this opportunity to, to help the public appreciate that Lake Monroe is not just our unique water supply. It is our only feasible water supply from now until the far distant future. We do not have, because of our particular uh, geography and geology, another alternative. Thank you. Wise words. Um, I'm curious how you have engaged with the recreational boaters specifically, but um, on Lake Monroe, are you working with them specifically on some of the action plan items? We have uh, some things in our action plan focused on recreational boating. So far, Friends of Lake Monroe partnered with Visit Bloomington a few years back. This was before my time, but they produced a very nice green boating tip, uh, laminated sheet that hand we handed out at some of the marinas. Uh, we've been working with the Lake Monroe Sailing Association, has been certified as a clean marina, and they're very so excited great. about sharing that knowledge with other marinas on the lake. And so we've heard some interest there and are hoping to facilitate those conversations. Uh, longer term, we'd like to see an increase in enforcement of no wake zones uh, to minimize the shoreline erosion issue. And education is tricky at the lake. There are so many people who come in from different places. Um, so we've tried a few things and we wanna try a few more, but that's definitely part of our focus as well. Great. Thank you again for being here. And um, are there any other questions for Ms. Sullivan? Really appreciate your work and you taking the time. Our next um, agenda item is the aviation department um, with Mr. Laverty.
Council, sorry, uh, I've got a motion there. Council, I move to open for discussion the Aviation Department's salary market study regarding the airport operations manager and director. Yeah. Thank you. You brought the whole team. Yeah, we got the whole crew. All right, you got everybody? Yeah. So we have okay. Mr. Laverty, the uh, director of the airport. Um, would you introduce the members of the board okay. as well, please? Yeah, we've got the three members of the Board of Aviation Commissioners with us. We have uh, Secretary Jean Devane. Jean, uh, how many years have you been on the board now? <laughs> more than 30. Oh, yeah, wow. More than 30. And uh, we have uh, Vice President Ken Ritchie. How many years? Uh, 21. All right. And we have the Board President, uh, Dr. William Pugh. 15 years on the board. Wow, it's a lot of experience sitting in front of me. Yeah, and uh, we're here tonight to have a conversation. The board wants to have a conversation about uh, compensation for a couple positions at the airport. Uh, we could start off with talking about the, the airport operations manager position. Uh, I think the council was supplied with a, a study from ADK and the, I mean, Simply put, it, I think it kind of illustrates the fact that we have uh, we have someone on staff who is uh, is grossly underpaid for their position and what they do at the airport. Um, I think it was back in 2019, uh, we had gone through a rewrite of that job description to kind of better capture the responsibilities and um, and and, and um, technical requirements and educational requirements. Uh, of that position. Uh, and I think there was a minor reclassification that, that took place. Um, however, uh, in, in, in late 2019, that there was an opening and uh, we were not able to recruit anybody. Um, we had some applications, but nobody was remotely qualified. So after leaving that vacancy for, I think it was close to five or six months, uh, we had we had to get moving, so uh, we promote. We had an internal promotion. Somebody kind of volunteered and stepped up, uh, uh, but in the long run, it didn't work out. Uh, there was kind of a, a crash and burn, and uh, a demotion, um, which led to a resignation later on. The person just couldn't get over it. I, you know, it's a difficult thing to deal with. Um, so then there was another vacancy, and we left that vacancy. We, we dealt with that for months again, uh, and we don't we don't get any remotely qualified candidates, and I think it has to revolve around what what we offer because I know uh, just before our opening there was another Indiana airport that was able to hire somebody uh, with a very similar position, but they paid a lot more and they received a good number of qualified candidates. So once again, um, just to get moving and kind of get on with life. Um, last year, we offered that position to another internal position uh, person, uh, and they kind of reluctantly took the job. They knew they, they, they felt like it was kind of beyond them. Uh, but pleasantly, um, that person kind of grew into the position a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's taken more of my time and um, other staff to kind of get that person to where we want them, but they're performing adequately at the time, and I'm pretty happy with them. But uh, it's also known that this person has other life plans and is leaving next year. Um, and I've already, he's already, I've already been told flat out by two other airports and one of our uh, engineering consultants that they're, they're going to go after him as well, too. He's, he's a pretty good kid, um, but he will be leaving. And I can't go back to having nobody in that position or putting somebody in that position who isn't qualified. Um, it's, it's one of the most, if not the most critical position at the airport, it's the airport operations manager. And they are the person who gets called you know, 24 seven if there's a deer on the runway or um, if you know, there's a, 
an operation in the middle of the night that requires aircraft rescue firefighting. They're there. You know, this is the person who is where this is where the rubber meets the road for the airport. And I can we, we cannot afford to go back to where we have been in the past with somebody who is unqualified for that position, because what ends up happening is I backfill and I've got that experience and I perform those duties so I can do the job. But then what happens is you don't have a director. You know, I'm not leading the airport and pushing it in the direction that the board wants it to go. So um, I think it was a year ago, we kind of waited for these, for the, for WIST to do their salary study. Um, and it came out and, um, you know, the, the numbers that they came out with, when I, when I know what some of these airports pay in Indiana, comparable airports like us that have towers and have commercial operations and perform aircraft rescue firefighting, uh, I know those directors and I know how much they pay. And the numbers that came out of the WIS study were, were very low. Um, and um, so we, uh, we consulted with uh, ADK. Uh, they're one of the preeminent um, kind of like headhunter firms in the aviation industry. And, and they performed this uh, analysis, which kind of shows that, yeah, at the midpoint, I think they're 26 percent below market, and at the high range, they're 30 percent below. Um, and that goes pretty much with what I understand. Uh, other airports are are paying for the same position, so we know it. Um, I know my guy knows it, <clears throat> and I know that people who want to hire him know it too. So even if for some strange reason he decided to stick around, he's not going to stick around for long. I mean, he's. So um, I think the board is, is kind of interested in having a conversation with council to see if they would support uh, an, an adjustment for this position that would reflect uh, what it takes to correct it with the ADK uh, analysis. And, and also in line with that um, correction, uh, I think there, there's a, there, we wanna have a conversation about it might require putting this position into an SO field uh, to make that happen. And then if we do that, uh, we feel, the board feels it would make a lot of sense to establish a grid so that whenever there's a requirement, like whenever there's a time, the one, the three, the eight year adjustments that typically take place and would take place for this role now can continue to happen without having to come back and recreate this conversation before the board at our aviation meeting and then come to council for what's typically a standard adjustment for most county employees. Okay, thank you. Um, do you, any of the board members want to speak before I turn it over to council for questions? I'd like to. <clears throat> okay. um, when I joined the board 21 years ago, there was a brand new airport director. Um, and many of you may have known him, Bruce. Um, he was great. Uh, he had been brought up under the wing of Colonel Boone, who was the airport director before him. At that time, we were a very local um, seat of the pants type operation. Uh, Colonel Boone was in the military and got experience there, but he was never a formally trained airport director. Uh, Bruce started working there, I think mowing the fields and whatnot when he was uh, very young and uh, sort of graduated and learned it from the seat of the pants. Uh, Bruce would, would typically help mow and do all the other things. We have grown, outgrown that model. And as much as I respect Colonel Boone and Bruce for what they achieved, which was monumental over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, we finally graduated to a point where we need to look at professional management. And when Bruce decided to leave and we were searching and we found Carlos, it was one of the best things that we'd ever done. We've now, I think it's opened our eyes as to the potential the professional management, professional training, professional experience at various airports. Uh, no one had ever really had any experience as a, during their, uh, before their tenure at Bloomington, uh, being an airport director or having gone through all those different um, positions at various other airports. And Bruce um, did a fantastic job 
We had record numbers of grants. Uh, we increased our income over the years that he was there. Uh, we brought Carlos in and that has accelerated from that point. And he has um, been very good at managing people, uh, understanding their needs. Um, we need uh, Carlos to be able to take hold of where we're going in the future, and that's developing 55 acres that you are aware of, and also bringing more activity to the field and attracting more flights and more uses for the airport. This is a star uh, business generating for the county uh, piece of property. And I think we have done a good job as custodians of the airport over the last many years, uh, but we also need to be good custodians going forward. And Monroe County, I know there's 92 counties and there are uh, similar departments in every county that I know make demands on the budget and demands on the salaries that need to be paid for these positions, but there are very few counties that have an airport like we have today and has grown to the point where I feel strongly about it needing to continue on to grow. Uh, we have uh, Cook had a lot to do with it, growing it to where it is today, but it's all, he's, Cook has also attracted other businesses like Catalan. Um, we need more of this in Bloomington. If you look back over 20 years ago and you think of the GEs and the RCAs and the United Technology Otis elevators are gone right now. And what we have started to replace them with are employers that have a long-term effect going forward and they need airport services. And there are other nice companies that will fit Bloomington's lifestyle, but we need a good airport. Those facilities are one of the components that attract those kind of companies to Monroe County. So uh, I think it's important that we start creating those positions and maintaining them so that we have continued growth and development. Thank you. Um, is it, can I turn it over to Councillor McKim here who clearly has a question or a comment? <laughs> did, did any of the rest of you have something you wanted to present? No, we mimicked what he had said and so it's no longer prolonging that because the infrastructure is the most important thing that we have for growth. Mm -hmm. And I heard from the uh, previous person here talking about Monroe Reservoir. That's also something we can't do without. And aviation, whether we like it or not, is a thing of the future, or it is the present and the future. And so without it, you have a second rate organ uh, town or county or what have you. So uh, without saying a whole lot, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but just think in terms of the infrastructure and what it means to the community. And airport is one of the key things that we have to depend upon. Okay. All right. Um, we have lots of people wanting to talk. I'm going to have um, Mr. McKenna. Thanks. Um, it, I think as everybody knows that uh, our classification consultant, uh, Wagner Irwin Shealy, uh, wrote a memo kind of addressing this situation. And I want to make a comment about that, but I was wondering if maybe Michelle would just very briefly summarize the, the conclude or, or Ms. Turner King would summarize the, uh, uh, the content of the, of the memo before I comment on it. The memo that, the memo that we received WIS um, indicated what information they looked at when they um, did the mark or the compensation study, and it listed 17 counties, seven cities, and various external market um, sources, including the Association of Indiana Counties Factbook, the AIM Salary Survey, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Employment and Wage Report, uh, Indiana Economic Growth Workforce Development, um, a WIS compensation data. And as I was summarizing that, sir, that memo, I will also add, I don't know that it came across in council's packet. Um, I was looking through the slides that the airport provided um, for the president in advance. My copies of the slides were blank. 
And so yeah. um, I had Ms. Shell send me a copy uh, or email me their slides and just kind of see what um, ADPA consultants looked at. And their survey comparables included the Columbus um, Airport in Columbus, Indiana, the Terre Haute Regional Airport in Terre Haute, Purdue's Airport in West Lafayette, and um, Abraham Lincoln Capital Airport in Springfield, Illinois. In comparing that data source with the WIS study, WIS does specifically indicate that they contacted Pico County, which I think would encompass the Terre Haute Airport. Um, it says they contacted Tippecanoe County and the city of Lafayette, which I'm not positive that it encompassed Purdue, but I mean, that is where Purdue is located. Um, it does not indicate, well, it says they contacted Bartholomew County. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, my issue with the WIS memo, I, so first of all, the, I, I believe the WIS is basically saying, you guys put all this effort into building a compensation system. You don't want to immediately break it the moment that, uh, it, you know, the very moment that you finally passed it. Um, but I think uh, while they did, uh, Ms. Turner King just named some jurisdictions that WIS looked at, they made it clear that they didn't specifically look at airports. They simply looked at, they, they matched essentially other positions that would uh, fall into the same category as a, I, what was that, Pat C? Is that what we decided that uh, yeah. the position is a Pat C? Um, so they would look at, at other jurisdictions positions that would fall into that Pat C classification and averaged or found the median of, of all them together, not specific airports. And so, they they're they are kind of two different methodologies not just different jurisdictions possibly but completely different methodologies at looking at things and so i think what frustrated me about the wis memo is that while i understand the goal it didn't really leave it give us a path forward i mean it we we still have the even though we want to maintain our compensation system i don't feel like it gave us any advice on actually how to deal with the situation where we're not getting qualified candidates. We simply are paying too little to get qualified candidates. And I guess I, I would really like it if we had the opportunity um, uh, either as a council or maybe as a, as a subgroup of the council to actually maybe talk with uh, uh, either Ken Irwin or one of the other consultants at WIS kind of interactively and be able to kind of get their advice on how to maintain the, the structure while actually being able to address a real problem on the ground. I mean, I, in, unless there was a solution that I didn't see in that memo, but all I saw in that memo was basically stay the course, but stay the course isn't really an option if we want to be able to hire people from, uh, to be able to fill these positions. Okay, I just want a quick, quick rebuttal about that. The, the WIS, it's a very watered down survey. There's only 107 other airports, like our airports in the country, when it comes to the classification. We're a, cla we're a class four part 139 commercial service airport with an air traffic control tower and 24 seven aircraft rescue firefighting services. And so if, if they're telling you that they surveyed 17 other airports in Indiana and all that stuff like that, then I know for, without a doubt that they're, they're, they're discussing, you know, smaller, lesser non-commercial service airports, which is watering down that, that analysis. Mm -hmm. There's only in Indiana, I think there's only three or four towered airports to begin with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like what the board had, but Ken here mentioned earlier, like the board and the airport has really built up over the, over the years and decades. And, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of people in the community, there's a, you have a, you have a highly specialized commercial service airport. And I agree with you, Jeff. That's exactly because I've been working on this. Even Bruce was a director trying to get his salary up because he was so far below everyone else. And the exact same points that you bring up were the problems that we had back then, that they were trying to compare his position with other positions in other counties. And it, it was unique what he was doing. Yeah, so a salary of a Pat C, this may be an adequate salary for a Pat C, but it's not for an airport operations right. director. What I'd uh, like to 
to have you do before we finish this conversation is to tell us what uh, the credentials are that you have to have to be able to provide the service that we want you to do. Uh, when you were discussing that with me, I'm not sure everybody knows that. I want, I want you to say that publicly. Oh, well, for my position or the position? Well, let's start out with well, yours because what we're talking about oh, is yeah. this person has to be ready to step in where, and then we, I want to yeah. hear what this, uh, the particular yeah, position to, that we're discussing right now. Step in this role, you would have to have, you know, a bachelor's in, in aviation management. You would have to have your uh, aircraft rescue firefighting certification from the FAA. Uh, we're looking for, for this role, we're looking for, you know, just two to three years of relevant experience at a part 139 commercial service airport. Um, and just right there, right, just that right there has disqualified, I think, every, every single candidate that's applied. Um, and then we look for a lot of uh, certifications with the American Association of Airport Executives. Uh, they're kind of the de facto credentialing agency for this, this industry. Um, and then for my position, I think the board is looking for someone with at least 10 years of experience managing an airport um, or managing departments in a large airport um, on top of the educational and additional certification requirements. And, and, and like I said, just, just looking at the degree and any kind of relevant experience has, has disqualified just about everything. <laughs> you don't find airport managers in, in every city or county, like, right? Like, there's only so many airports, and it's not like, um, you know, there's, I could go be a teacher anywhere. Nothing against teachers, but there's school districts and teachers everywhere. You don't run into airport management professionals anywhere. <laughs> or nerds. So I, I simply, I, I want to make a couple of comments, but first of all, thank you for being here. All of you really appreciate you taking your time out to educate us on, on this issue, which is, which is important. And I think, you know, I certainly share a lot of your goals that I want this airport to thrive. I want it to grow. And I, I think you've done a fantastic job of doing just that. Um, uh, I will say uh, I am experiencing the same technological issues as uh, the council is having where I wasn't able to see the entire report. So I look forward to continuing this conversation um, when, when I can read that report. And I, and I will say, I, I think I, I echo um, what Councilor McKim was, was saying, and I, I want to be really careful that, you know, we don't create grids in every single department and get back to that system of there's, there's different employee grids for every department that this, it's a headache to kind of manage that type of system. So I just want to make sure that we're continuing to maybe to work with WIS as well to try to understand the intricacies of, of this. And so I, I'm very interested in continuing this conversation. I also want to thank all of you for being here. Everyone at this table right here is a, a, a source of a lot of wisdom and leadership in this community in various ways, with Carlos being the new person to that, that role, and we're grateful for you. I, I don't doubt anything that you're saying about the need at all. Um, the issue that we have is that probably every department and every elected official can make a case where something needs to be different from that WIS study. What I've heard you say through this study that you all have done is that the comparisons are wrong that WIS looked at. I don't think WIS is infallible, but it is a system we've invested a ton in. And I say that as former PAC chair that went through that process, I want that process to work because if we deviate from that, we're spending a lot of money for some folks that are not in this county that may not be giving us the best result. Here's what my hope would be. If we could get WIS to take a look at some of the, the counter offer, counter discussion that you're talking about in that comparison, perhaps they can reevaluate where they've got that and give us a better idea. The whole purpose of WIS is so that we're not from this council picking favorites, winners, losers. I've heard that put that way to me many times, 
because I've had a lot of suggestions on how we should do things just like this. So to maintain the integrity of that process, I'd like to see WIS take up kind of what you're offering. I know that they're going to look at another consultant and say, well, we don't know how they did this or that, but surely they could look at the parameters and say, hey, look, here's another um, thing that we've not considered. Aviation is different than anything else. It is apples and oranges. At one time I was up in the uh, Columbus Tower and I remember seeing their <laughs> toilet. I don't know if it's still there, but they- It's still there. <laughs> and that's not our tower. We, we have a different tower, but they've got a friends, they've got a, a toilet that sets up there with you while you're the, the, the person saying, I'm not qualified to talk about this other than the toilet. All the comforts and fun. Yeah. I can't- So I think that, look, I think that could be a path for us so that we can make an informed decision, maintain the integrity of, uh, of, of our system kind of moving forward. I just kind of throw that out as, as something that if we have a WIS system, let's keep a WIS system mm -hmm. and maybe they could look at that and, and respond to some of these parameters. Well, I, I guess just I'd say in response, they kind of already did. I mean, that is what their memo sort of did. They looked at that uh, at the study, the, at the airport study. And they basically said, well, you know, that's not our methodology. We use this other methodology and you should stick with that other methodology. But they didn't give us, a, I mean, we still have the problem on the ground that they can't get qualified applicants. And that's regardless of the integrity of the system, if it doesn't get us qualified applicants, it's not working. And so I, I, I kind of feel like we've already done that, that first step. Um, and I feel like we need something maybe a little more interactive with them. It looks like Ms. Turner King wants to say something. Yes, I do, thank you. Um, in preparation for this um, conversation, I had um, thought of some talking points that I might point out to uh, council, which I think most of you have already thought about, which is, you know, you put a lot of effort in money into WIS, you immediately want to break away from it. And then the other was um, maybe consider the concern for a precedent that you're setting if for other departments who don't agree with their compensations. Uh, the other thing that I would add is um, in speaking to WIS, there is a second step where you might be able to, they might be able to reevaluate whether this position should be a PAC C and it's a more in-depth desk on it. So it would have someone go out and sit down with Whoever's doing this position and see, you know, should they adjust the classification, which they would adjust the conversation. Well, I feel like we need to do something yeah. to move forward. It's simply not, I, I don't think it's a uh, it's a viable option to just say tough. No. Um, so maybe that's maybe that's the answer is to ask them to maybe maybe it shouldn't be a patsy. Maybe the and, and you know and WIS is a, a big part of the WIS system is also the relevant labor market that they're that the employee is being selected from. They're very specific about which labor market. And I think, uh, as Carlos pointed out, you know the labor market for airport directors or airport operations personnel is not that big. It's not yeah. the same as maybe you know other other employees that might fit into the Pat C. You know, Pat C is a is a highly qualified employee. That is a a professional staff that are recruited from not not just locally, but but still the this the uh, people experience in aviation might be more rarefied than that. So I mean, I guess I I would support it going going back and maybe trying a, a, a looking at whether a reclassification would be appropriate. I don't know how others feel? Other oh. We have a, a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Just one short comment about when we looked to hire uh, a replacement and we re Carlos was interviewed by all of us sitting here at the table. He brought to the table some military experience. And as you're well aware, uh, Crane is just down the road from us. And we've had the Secretary of the Army, all kinds of biggie guys in here heavy duty airplanes, uh, working with Secret Service and uh, CIA, all kinds of guys. It goes unsaid, but he has done that. Um, and was on, he and I are the only two ex-military people. And it, it was a 
unexpected bonus, I will say. So when you get asked for a resume, you, you don't expect to get that, but it was there for him. So, there you go. Thanks. Are there any other comments or questions from council members? Yeah. Um, I wholeheartedly agree that what we need to do is um, contact WIS and set up a meeting to determine next steps, whether that's a desk audit, which I'm, I'm not sure how, maybe, would you be open to that if that was? I wouldn't really be very optimistic about the outcomes of a desk yeah. audit. Um, I think to get a feel for this job, you would really have to follow in for, for more than a week at a time to get a really good feel, um, especially during like, you know, Big Ten athletic season, they're here around the clock. And, or if there's a snowstorm, they're here around the clock. Um, but if he comes here, you know, I just, I'm not crazy about the idea of a desk audit. What I would really like to start with maybe is, uh, and, and ADK who did this has offered, you know, further services and perhaps they could interface directly with WIS because I feel like WIS has a, a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding uh, of our airport environment. Um, just surveying every airport in Indiana doesn't really capture what's going on here and what we're trying to accomplish and what we have to live up to when it comes to our regulations with the FAA and, and, and the federal uh, airspace system. So, uh, you know, maybe having those two interface so that, because I, I, I mean, re reading off who they, who they surveyed just it just shows like we're not Bedford. And, and I think if we had that level of service here, there would be a huge issue. Uh, we're just, we're a bigger airport and we service larger corporate traffic, military traffic, and we have to live up to a different set of standards. So um, I'm not optimistic about what the outcomes of a desk audit would be um, just because of the nature of the job. It's very, it's very unique, um, but perhaps having ADK and WIS interface can lead to something else. I guess I, I feel like some of those uh, elements that, that you described that, that make it unique would be surfaced during a desk audit though. I mean, that's kind of the point is to understand the parameters of the job, um, which, you know, might, yeah, admittedly, of course they might not occur, you know, the most challenging parts of the job might not occur on any average day. That's we, we all, you know, at least a lot of our jobs, uh, you know, they, they kind of go up and down as far as the amount to which they, they uh, challenge our skills. But I mean, I think that's, that's the way that that is part of the process. And that's certainly been the process in other uh, organizations that I've been part of when there's question about whether uh, about, about the scope of a job or whether a job is properly classified. You know, a desk audit is kind of a basic uh, sort of a fundamental element that underlies any other decision making. And so I guess I don't, if we don't at least do that, I don't, I don't see a really good path forward. I, to me, that, that's kind of the, the, the first basic step before we move on. I think WIS is very good at what they do. There are some limitations and perhaps what you suggest might point out those limitations. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's, that's your opportunity to, to make the case. Right. Um, another thing that, that jumped out at me was the, uh, the number of specific certifications or credentials that this position requires, all higher level positions have a, an expertise associated with them or multiple expertise that could be applied. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, you know, we have figured out ways to look at particular certifications at, um, in ways that, mm -hmm. that allow for compensation in the past that, that's mm -hmm. not unprecedented so um of course Wiss would maybe hate that too who knows but um i'm trying to you know i'm just trying to think outside the box and um 
I definitely think the first step is to set up a meeting um, with WIS, a few council members perhaps, and, um, mm -hmm. and go from there. Um, if you're available, we might pull you in um, on that and see if we can get a path forward on this issue. But this has been really illuminating. I really appreciate all, I mean, I can see a lot of work has gone into really making the case and mm -hmm. um, I appreciate that and appreciate your time. Yeah, and you. I volunteer to participate in the conference and I think yeah. Councillor Hawk does too, probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got your committee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thanks so very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, one other issue. Oh, oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I don't have the support. Go now, boys. Again, it's yours in SO position. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, I'm sorry about that, I got so involved in because uh, I've been involved in this over the years with uh, the positions and the pay raise and dealing with lists and whatnot. Uh, when Carlos was hired, the pay rate that he was given uh, was uh, not kept up with as far as cost of living and the typical pay raises that you would see in that position. So what we're looking at, what we're asking for is that we get him caught up to where he would B, if he was typically on a three-year um, review. Right now, he's not been getting the kind of increases that are commiserate with uh, some of the other uh, raises that have been given to uh, positions of similar duration, three years and whatnot. Um, currently, he started out at 87.3. Um, he is now at 91, and to get him to um, his cost of living adjustments, he would need to be at 100,000 for 414. Um, just getting him where he should be, and then because of his performance in the role that he's had, um, uh, we were, he was, suggesting a um, uh, perhaps an increase of 10%, which would be $8,300 based on his original um, starting salary. Uh, so for 2023, you know, the board would like to see him at 108,731 if you add all those up. So we're looking at cost of living and also the merit increases that would have been accrued over that period of time. So essentially, he's he has gone uh, since 2019 to 2022 with a four percent increase overall. Which, given his performance and where he has taken the airport in such a short period of time, seems really inadequate. And as I back over the years, I worried about Bruce because I knew he had been approached by other airports. And uh, now witnessing Carlos's performance over the last three years, I sincerely worry about it uh, because we have a high performing quality individual in this role. And uh, I know he likes us, we like him, but again, a man with the family and um, other obligations and wanting to advance his career uh, I think anybody would be tempted if the right position became open and was offered. So I think we owe it to ourselves to try to be competitive in this marketplace for the manager that we have, and we've proven it. In the past, We even when Bruce left, we were thinking, okay, we'll hire somebody and kind of grow them in the position. And that now that I look back on it, that was a stupid attitude to have. Yep. Um, we, we really needed to go for the gusto and get somebody with the qualifications like Carlos had. And it's, we've, we've proven that he can perform. Um, the other reason for that, going for the people that are 
performing in those positions or qualified for those positions is that if they don't do the job, I don't feel bad about asking them to take a walk because they came into it with the credentials that they were going to be able to do it. If they don't do it, then we need to start looking further. And uh, Carlos has been a very delightful surprise. He's gone above and beyond where we thought he would be at this particular time. So we wanna support him. And uh, he's opened our eyes and taught us a lot, even though we've got, well, I'm in the what, 75 years of, yeah. You know, uh, he's taught us a great deal uh, over the time that he's been there the last three years, taking care of a lot of headaches and problems that frankly I was worried about and I was getting involved in before Carlos came on board. So uh, kudos to Carlos and that's reason why we feel justified in asking for this increase for Carlos. Any questions or comments? No. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. Carlos, it looks like you've impressed what appears to be a pretty tough crowd there. So congratulations there. Um, and uh, we've got a lot to think about. So appreciate that quite a bit. Yes. They have an announcement to make. What's happening next weekend? Oh, P yeah, yes. marketing. Yeah, a little bit of marketing. So, uh, sorry, we, uh, it's on. It's on. Uh, Saturday, uh, we're going to have a runway day at the airport. We're going to start the day off at 8 o'clock with a 5K on the runways. Um, it's a very rare and unique opportunity for something like this. Uh, the, air, the FAA hates to see it, but we had the runways closed because we're doing a $3 million LED upgrade uh, to our main runway lighting system. Uh, so they couldn't really say no, and we're doing a 5k, uh, right now, um, we have like, I think 70 people signed up to run it. And, uh, from, from what I hear, anything over 30 is a good number these days. Uh, they mm. said, th th they say after 2012, uh, there's been a big drop in, uh, youth being interested in running 5k's anyways. So we're having a 5k. That'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a really fast 5k. You don't get much flatter than a, than a <laughs> runway. Yeah, there's no curbs to worry about. So that'll be really fun. And then we're going to come back at two o'clock and kind of kick off the rest of the day's activities. We're going to have a musical showcase with uh, five or six local bands. Uh, so we'll have music pretty much from two to nine. Um, we're going to have hot air balloons uh, on display. Uh, it's doing like either a launch in the evening, but they'll be doing tethered. Uh, up and down rides. We'll have helicopter rides. Uh, due to uh, Jeff's uh, support here, we may be able to have a drone demonstration out there. Um, <laughs> we hit a snag with the drone box earlier on, but uh, Jeff may uh, may swing into the rescue on that the last minute. I was like, I think, I think Jeff McKim has a 107 license. And so he stepped in to save the day. Uh, we're going to have aircraft on static display. We're going to have a car cruise in. So if you have like a, a muscle car or like a Model A, Model T, you can cruise out onto our ramp. And then whenever you feel like it, you can actually do a little parade on our crosswind runway. Um, we'll have uh, like your planes will be out there on static display for photo opportunities. We're going to have a boatload of food trucks, switchyard brewing is gonna be there, um, face painting, there's gonna be a kid zone, bouncy houses, we're gonna have vendors, um, crane is gonna have a display of some sort of weaponry. I, some weaponry. sort of weaponry. <laughs> weaponry. <laughs> a giant space All laser. I heard, <laughs> all I heard this, is, this is the quote crane. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> they're going to have some, some cool weaponry on display. And then we're going to finish the night off uh, with a, a showing. It was originally supposed to be the original Top Gun. In June, we purchased the rights to show it. And then uh, I think in the middle of July, they called us uh, Swank Licensing, who does all the licensing. And they said, sorry, Paramount put a moratorium on any public viewings of the original Top Gun because the new one is performing so well. Um, so they yanked the rights from us. So we can't go with Top Gun and we're gonna go with the 2019 version of Midway. There's a lot of aviation and action in it. It's mostly family friendly. 
except for people getting killed. Um, so yeah, so we're going with that. So it should be it should be a really cool fun day, and um, we're looking forward to in 2019. If you'll recall, uh, we did a small event out there at the airport with WTIU for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, um, and then COVID came and we we couldn't do any public you know activities like this again. So we're kicking it off again, and we're trying to we're, we're going to see how this works out. And the hope is that we can have some sort of annual event or even multiple events at the airport. There's a it's a big space. People like being there, and we like having people out there. So hopefully it turns out. And uh, tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'd like to invite all of you to come and see what we do. You're not hiding anything. I think it's one of the uh, most unique positions to be involved in, and that's airport, airport management, and what it does for the community. So I want to see all of you out visiting, and I'm too old to fly anymore. But I would I take you for a ride in my aircraft. <laughs> Dr. Pugh and I are, I think, the only two uh, pilots in the group. But yeah. come out and we can just if you just come out and sit, and uh, we'll show you everything that we do, okay? You have a barber shop too, right? What's that? Did you still have a barber shop there? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, have a barber shop. Yeah. Too, Is this still? Yeah, she's doing great. She's added another seat. Yeah. Um, she just signed another five-year lease, and it's going good for her. That's great. Yeah. That's wild. Well, thank you. For well, your thank, time. You. Thank, thank you for the invitation thank too. You. Thank you. All right. Good luck next yeah, weekend. Um, could you, I would like to first set up a meeting where we're discussing paths forward and options because I don't think the desk audit is the only solution. Okay. So no desk audit quite yet, but a meeting. Um, so, um, so uh, reach out to Wes and then want to do this have a list of certain members that want to be included on this conversation. Ms. Councillor McKim and Councillor Hawk both indicated interest. I, I, the only thing I, I would suggest is that not necessarily be a PAC meeting so that it could just be remote. We right. don't necessarily right. need to drag anybody into town for this. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I like that idea a lot too. Okay. Councilor Woods, do you want to be a part of this as well? Um, I would love to be a part of this unless that causes an issue of, you know, other counselors. Maybe someone from PAC should be on it instead of me. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, too. then please include me. But we cannot call it Pat. Got it. Right. Have no, I just wanted to make sure that was represented. And I'm a dope for that's what I was trying to clarify is you know, how, how what Yeah, and with two PAC members, I don't think I need to make a party. So I'm more than happy to have Councillor Wiltz. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, he asked what the next steps are. I'm going to contact Wes and uh, reach out for a meeting, so that's okay. where we're going to start. Okay. We'll definitely keep you in the loop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not hearing Kate. Well. I can't hear anything either, so clearly yeah. there's... It's something in the room that's it's not. Okay. If the speakers could go up louder, it would be wonderful. Not, there's there's a movement in the. <clears throat> now we're much better. Thank you. Are you saying because all of a sudden I can I can read what everybody's saying? Am I messing everything up? Because uh, that that is very helpful. Yeah, being able to read it. 
I, I know. I, I think people think I'm not paying any attention because I'm not looking at them, but I'm reading. Oh, I just look at it. I see that. We are at item 10 with the treasurer's department. Council, I move to approve the treasurer's request for additional appropriations in fund 1000003 general fund treasurer in the amount of $9,050 in the personnel category. Second. Our treasurer, Jessica McClellan is here, welcome. Thank you. I'm trying to get close carefully to this mic so we don't blow up. <laughs> There was a difference in what was on this, what was in the 2022 salary ordinance for these two salary lines and what was appropriated. So in reviewing our budgets through the rest of the year, these are just um, the amounts that are needed in those salary lines so that those so that it matches the salary ordinance and we can continue to pay throughout the rest of the year. It's not, it's no change to the salary ordinance. Right. And as a reminder, it's because we made changes after approving the budget last year. So this was expected. Exactly. All right. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Yes. I'm, I just want to apologize that I didn't ask for you to be able to go in ahead like the assessor's office because this really is housekeeping. I mean, we have to do the additional appropriation, but the work has already been done. This was just an error at getting this. So I apologize to you. No problem. I'm happy yeah. to be here. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with us. Sure, no problem. Clearly, it's good to be here. Barely keeping up with what's written on the paper today. So <laughs> I couldn't remember exactly how this happened either. So I'm glad you, that you all remember it. It's fresher in your minds than oh, mine. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments or questions? One yes. more comment is that I hope that we'll look at all the other uh, budgets to make sure that we're not going to have the same kind of thing that they might need an additional appropriation and get that. I, I sent a, an email out to all of the elected officials to remind them of this, and Jessica has been the only one. I know that several of them were able to do in-house transfers, so um, I can do another email reminder, but as far as I know, I think everybody's good. I haven't heard from anybody else regarding this uh, need for initiatives. Yeah, if they've had vacancies, they have room for exactly. to transfer yeah. but if they don't then let's just do it in one fell swoop like work you know it's just don't drag them in here and make them sit here for three hours no, i'm so sorry <laughs> call the question <laughs> yes so um is there any uh public comment on this item no um it looks like we do a roll call vote please Councillor Munson. Yes. Councillor Decker. Yes. Councillor Hawk. Yes. Councillor Iverson. Yes. Councillor Wills. Yes. Councillor McKim. Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Um, we're now at item 11 from for additional appropriations in fund 25020000 cable franchise user fees in the amount of $208,000 in the services category. Second. Do we have any anybody for this? Okay. Um, I thought it was gonna be Rick. Yeah. Um, well, does anyone on like, council have uh, insight into this item that they'd like to share? Well, I mean, as as his uh, liaison, I did I did talk to him about it, and um, you know, early on when he was uh, discovering basically that some of these budget lines were significantly under budgeted, but. Um, it does seem like they, this is s significant enough and significantly complex enough that I suspect that the council may have uh, questions. So we should probably table if, if we don't have a representative to, to discuss. I agree with that assessment. I did hear the presentation to the commissioner, so I've, I've heard it, but I'm ready to vote on it, but I don't know why they aren't here, so. 
Okay, well, um, I would entertain a motion. Council, I move to table this item to September 13th, September 13th regular session. Second. Great. Uh, any question, comment on the motion to table? Seeing none, we have a voice vote on, right? Voice vote for tabling. So, all in favor of tabling this item until uh, September 13th, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion passes, we've tabled the item. Um, next is item 12, uh, our CARES board. Council, I move to approve the CARE, CARES board's request for additional appropriations in fund 1148-0000, county drug-free community in the amount of $44,062.27 in the services category. Second. And it looks like we have uh, Lisa on Zoom. Yes, good evening, council members. Um, I'll just read to you um, what you might have in front of you. Um, in addition to the numbers that were just read, I just wanna let you know that I'm Lisa Muser, I'm the CARES coordinator. And to give you a little bit of information about the CARES board, the CARES board is a local coordinating council or LCC from Monroe County. And um, each county has an LCC. The councils were established by the executive order under Governor By as a part of the drug-free Indiana mission to support and promote local efforts to prevent and reduce harmful involvement with alcohol and other drugs. The primary responsibility of the board is to distribute funds to justice, treatment and prevention programs and initiate, initiatives in Monroe County. The process begins with a community assessment where we collect data and input about what's happening in the county. This assessment provides a framework for our community plan, which lists objectives and steps that can be taken to reduce community drug and alcohol issues. The plan sent to the state for approval, and then once the um, approved, the state the grant process proceeds. The drug drug free communities grant fund um, comes from alcohol countermeasure fees and drug interdiction fees. These fees are assigned by all judges. They are not always collected since some people can't pay. The funds are allocated by making 25% of the total available to justice treatment and prevention programs that apply for grants with the remaining percentage for operating costs or to spread back out throughout the three main categories. Um, usually at this time, I, I read uh, about the, I, I give a listing of the programs that we are requesting allocations for. Would you like me to read through those um, grant programming, program names? I, I think it would be great to, to hear the list, yeah. Fabulous, okay, so in the justice category, we have uh, the Monroe County Drug Treatment Court, and that's requesting $1,727.62 for urine drug screens. From Monroe County, I'm sorry, Monroe Circuit Court Prob Probation Department, um, they're requesting $1,872.10 for journals. Um, from New Leaf, New Life, they have two programs that they've requested allocations for. One is inside the jail, programming inside the jail for $4,639.10, and then one, a program that's um, outside the jail, and that's for $4,615.27. Um, I'm also happy to read any descriptions from those programs if you'd like to know more about them. Um, in the treatment intervention category, we have two grant requests from Amethyst House. One is from the men's program, and one is from the women's program. They each are requesting $4,267.98. Courage to Change is requesting $4,318.13. And then we've got the prevention category. Big Brothers Big Sisters is requesting $4,271.63. The Beacon um, is requesting $4,282.62. Indiana Recovery Alliance is requesting $4,299.84. And then we are requesting $5,000 for admin costs. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Um, mm -hmm. Are there any questions or comments from Council on this item? None? Great, okay. Um, thank you for being here and uh, waiting uh, patiently. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it's, it's one of those meetings. Um, and I, for one, am it, you know, pleased to continue to support this. It's obviously um, something that's in place that, that we have the privilege of saying yes to. And um, that's the way I, I look at it anyway. So um, is there any public comment on this item? And seeing none, I will call for a roll call vote, please. Councilor Iverson. Yes. Councilor Munson. Yes. Councilor Decker. Yes. Councilor Wilkes. Yes. Councilor Hawk. Yes. Councilor McKim. Yes. Councilor Crossley. Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. We are at item 13. Oh my goodness. Uh, from our building department. Council, I move to approve the building department's request to amend the 2022 salary ordinance to correct account line 13110 residential building inspector to commercial building inspector. Second. Mr. LaRue is here um, as our building commissioner. And I will thank you for your patience. Thank you all for still smiling at almost eight o'clock. I sure appreciate it. Nice, nice to see everybody's faces. I love it. Um, this is this item. Uh, in, I inadvertently overlooked it uh, during the uh, salary ordinance uh, when we were here talking about rearranging the building department. Um, currently, we have uh, in the budget three residential inspectors and only one commercial inspector. And uh, the predominant load of the department at this time is commercial inspections. Um, so I would like to request that this, uh, this amendment uh, be made so that we can fill a second commercial inspector position. This seems very straightforward. Are there any questions or comments from council? Okay. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. Councilor Hall. Yes. Councilor Munson. Yes. Councilor Iverson. Yes. Councilor McKim. Yes. Councilor Crossley. Yes. Councilor <clears throat> Decker. Yes. Councilor Wilms. Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of the evening. <laughs> we already did number 14. So we're going to um, item. 15 on our agenda, um, which is the Sophia Travis Community Service Grants Committee. Um, and I have some stuff to say, and then I'll turn it over to Councillor Munson. So, um, Councillor Councilor Munson, Councillor Crossley, and Councillor Decker served on the committee this year along with to citizen members, uh, Jean Kapler, who is joining us, and Josh Johnson, who was here, but because we took so long, <laughs> had to leave. Um, so tonight, um, Ms. Kapler will um, advise uh, the council of the recommendations to, uh, as to the list of the awardees and the amounts for council approval. And then following that recommendation, um, there will also be a recommendation by the Grants Committee for the Council to approve an ordinance 2022-29. And, um, and with that, I believe I will uh, turn it over to Councilor Munson for an update. I just have a few words to add and uh, my own personal special thanks to our citizen members, Jean Kapler and Josh Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson served for two years and we will, we wish we could keep some of our citizen members for longer, but uh, 
the tradition is uh, two years of service. For this year, we had 26 applicants um, requesting a total of nearly $162,000 in project funds. And we had $151,220 to award. And uh, we do have our citizen members uh, read us the committee's recommendations. And following that, I, uh, Councilor Deckard will, will state the resolutions. Does that sound good? Very well. Please, Jean. Okay, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here to present our, our recommendations for uh, grant awards. So uh, first agency is all options for their diaper program, uh, award recommendation of $5,000. Amethyst House for their residential food, uh, $4,960. Area 10 Agency on Aging Adult Guardianship Program for the Monroe and Owen County Adult Guardianship Program, uh, $5,800. Area 10 Agency on Aging and Right Community Center Refresher uh, to refresh their community center, uh, $5,740. Beacon Inc. for life-saving tools for persons experiencing homelessness, uh, $7,320. Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Monroe County for the Big Tool Chest Project, $7,400. Boys and Girls Clubs of Bloomington for Accessible Transportation for Crestmont Youth, $9,400. Cancer Support Community for Food and Transportation Assistance for Patients, $6,800. Catholic Charities Bloomington Counseling Services, Living with ADHD, a Parent Support Group, uh, $3,260. Uh, CJAM, the Community Justice and Mediation Center, for their program outreach and training, $2,850. Courage to Change Sober Living for a Fresh Start Rent Scholarship for $3,000. Girls Inc. of Monroe County for their Fall 2022 Evening Program, $7,700. Girls Rock Bloomington uh, for their summer camp, $6,550. Grace Center Inc. for food purchase, $2,880. Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry, uh, the Meet the Need program, $4,220. Indiana Recovery Alliance for the Water Security Plan, $6,480. Lotus Education and Arts Foundation for an Articulated Puppets Arts and Movement Program, $5,440. Monroe County United Ministries is supporting Monroe County Families Financial Aid Assistance Fund for $4,480. Mother Hubbard's Cover for Transportation Assistance Fund, $6,590. New Hope for Families, for Making Homelessness Brief for Families, $11,480. New Leaf, New Life, for Case Management Salary Support, $6,300. Planned Parenthood, for Safety Net Family Planning Services, $5,000. Sojourn House for Residential Fire Detection, Alarm, and Moni Monitoring System, $6,230. Team First Book, Getting Back on Track with Books, $2,100. The Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce Foundation for their Middle School Tour of Opportunity and for DEI training, $9,240 and the town of Steinsville for their Steinsville Community Library, $5,000. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean Kepler. Council, I make a motion to approve resolution 2022-23, award of Sophia Travis Community Service Grants, which reads, 
Whereas Monroe County government has for years supported and encouraged the work and goals of private community social service organizations by awarding them grant monies. And whereas in 2008, the Monroe County Council assumed the duties and obligations of overseeing the awarding of community service grants. And whereas the Monroe County Council adopted resolution 2013-15, a resolution renaming the community service grant program in honor of Sophia Travis. And whereas in 2016, the Monroe County Council by resolution 2016-23 added nutrition and youth enrichment opportunities to the areas of public need to be eligible for Sophia Travis grant funding. And whereas pursuant to the guidelines of resolution 2008-51, a grant application review committee for 2022 made up of three council members, Cheryl Munson, Chair, Jennifer Crossley and Trent Deckert and two private citizens of Monroe County, Gene Kapler and Joshua Johnson was established to review applications for community service grant funds. And whereas for 2022, the total amount budgeted for community service grants is $151,222. And whereas the grant application review committee, after a thorough review of all applications, invited all applicants to appear at a public meeting on Wednesday, July 27th, 2022, and make presentations to the committee and the public. And whereas the grant application review committee, after hearing the presentations and further review of all applications, has recommended to the council that $151,220 in the community services grant line be awarded as per the breakdown shown in the list below. And now therefore be it resolved that the Monroe County Council's total distribution of the community service fund for 2022 as read by Ms. Kapler be split into parts A and B, part A awarding agencies all options in Planned Parenthood totaling $10,000 and part B awarding the remaining mentioned agencies totaling $141,220 for a grand total distribution of $151,220. Second. Good. Wow. Good. Um, are there any questions or comments from council? I would just like to say um, this was the first time that I've, well, you know, of course it's the first time because I'm the first time being on the council. Um, <laughs> But just first time dealing with it on county side, because I've also been a part of the city um, side, which had a similar type of, uh, which has a similar type of program. So it was just really interesting and it was amazing to work with um, counselors Munson and counselors Decker and our private citizen, um, Jean Kapler and Joshua Johnson. It was amazing that all of us were able to sit down and all, almost to the point where we, it was kind of weird, um, where we all came up with the same type of allocation. I think there were a couple of wonky ones um, in terms of actual mistakes, uh, not wonky um, or by any means, but it was just really interesting um, because in looking at all of the programs, we have a lot of need um, from feeding our, those that are, are hungry, um, to those that are experiencing homelessness and substance use as the same thing um, for, you know, children and, and services. So I really appreciated being a part of this and being able to see the different types of um, need, how we can benefit and better our community. And um, so, yeah, it was just nice to be a part of that. So I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. And thank you to everybody that was um, a part of the committee to work for the greater good of Monroe County. So. I, I wanna say, and not let this get away, just my absolute gratitude to Councilor Munson, who <laughs> really takes this to heart. I think this is the second time I've served on this committee and she makes that as easy a process as you could get in a county government meeting. And it's tremendous how much good is done and the focus remains on the agencies that apply and the people that they serve. And it's awesome. And we were very fortunate this year 
in this process to be joined by Councillor Crossley, who is a great voice in this process, and our two uh, community members who I'm big fans of anyway, both Josh and Jean, who were strong voices. And I kind of did a thing this year of listening more to what those community voices were saying, because if ever there was a time to be aware of that, right now is that time. And congratulations to all these recipients. I wish there were more dollars for this. And certainly we always want more applicants and we'll keep working on that process to get there. So I wanted to say that I forgot to mention something important and that is for the public. If you would like to know more about the agencies that have been awarded grants, um, this information is on the County Council website and you can hear uh, information from the agencies themselves on uh, the CATS uh, recording of uh, the agency's presentations to the committee. So this is, this is your funding, this is your community public, and thank you for your support of all the organizations that we also uh, have the pleasure of supporting. Any other council comment? All right. I just want to thank you, Jean, for your patience this evening, but also <laughs> your service on, on the committee. Um, I wasn't on it this year. We sort of have a little tussle every year trying to uh, get see who gets to be on the committee because it is uh, it's really rewarding for us. And also it's rewarding to work with um, members of the public who are so engaged and willing to serve. So thank you. Um, we will now open for public comment, and I don't see any in the room. Uh, anybody wishing to make public comment on this item can raise their hand if they're on Zoom. Not seeing anyone. So um, we will move to a roll call vote on resolution 2022-23A, which is the awards for the all options in Planned Parenthood grants. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Iverson? <clears throat> yes. Councilor Hogg? No. Councilor Wills? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Motion passed six to one. Now, could we have a roll call vote now on resolution 2022-23B, which is the awards for the remaining stated agencies? Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wills? Yes. Councillor Hogg? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Thank and you. Congratulations to all the agencies. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Um, our next item is item 16 from the auditor's office. Ooh, do we need to adopt that second resolution? Yes, we. B. We do. On yes, Travis. we do. There's a 15 B. Bom, bom, bom. <laughs> Here we go. Surprise and everything. And I, I'll read this resolution again, the big one. This is a different, yeah. It, yeah. Do you want me to do the whereas? No. 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 Do the now therefores. Okay. If you're going to do just part of it. Yeah. Okay, so now that's even still pretty long. Isn't it? Okay, that's like pages and pages. It, it okay, is, it's Could very, some, very long. There is an attached resolution, and instead of reading it, refer to it as attached. Okay, mm -hmm. Council, I move to approve ordinance 2022 29 as attached and displayed in the packet, readopting procedures for awarding community service grants. Second. Lovely. Um, 
we could use a little explanation here. I believe, Councillor Munson. I'll, I'll, I'll start this explanation by saying that there are three resolutions uh, in effect. Um, 2008, 2013, and 2016 uh, that relate to Sophia Travis Community Services Grants. And our attorney uh, took on the work of coalating these, coalescing these, and also dealing with uh, uh, particular concerns that committee members had about um, service on the committee that it be spelled out and um, that there be uh, an explicit uh, statement regarding uh, organizations that wish to submit more than one application, which uh, I would like our uh, esteemed council attorney to uh, fill us in about. Hello. summarize the changes or conditions that are made. Um, the first change resolves the differences in information that was contained in the existing resolution and what was in the application in, or in the application packet. Um, so it was just a few words that were omitted. Um, for example, I think the resolution just said veterans and, and, and uh, information in the application said veterans assistance. So we clarified those differences. Um, we changed the name of the five member committee. Previously in the resolutions, they were called the review committee. Now they're just the grants committee. I think that's how I'm going to read the um, There were additions clarifying the terms of citizen members and the procedure for a citizen member. If, if the procedure is for if a citizen member was unable to perform the duties, um, how, they, how a replacement would be made. And then um, we added. Big chunk of it is setting out the application guidelines. So just to summarize, to set out guidelines of what the process is. Um, it includes, and there's a, the addition of including a limit so that social service agents can submit one application per agency <coughs> unless they're submitting a collaborative project application. And I looked at Jack Hopkins' um, guidelines on this collaborative project and kind of mimic what they do. We define what a collaborative project is in the ordinance, and basically, a collaborative project will allow agencies to work together and expand their social service or expand their services in areas they might, might not otherwise be able to. So, to give you an idea for um, some of the previously considered Jack Hopkins collaborative projects, included, you know, um, the assistance with development of proper departments. Thank you. That was a great summary. Appreciate it. Um, are there any other, are there any comments or questions from council on this, this changes? Is there any public comment on this item? And if seeing none, um, a roll call vote, please. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Decker? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Hawk? I'll just have to vote yes and trust everybody because I've been so busy studying the other things I didn't study this. And I don't know how much of a change it's making. I, didn't, I mean, you know, you can only do so much. I ran out of time. So I guess I have to vote, so I guess I'll just vote yes. But 
I'm trusting our county attorney to be saying this is what we're supposed to be doing to make it. That's what I'm going by here. Mm -hmm. Kelly, Councilor Wills? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Now we are moving to item 16 with our auditor's office. Council, I move to approve the auditor's request to add a new position and job description, Assistant County Financial Director, 40 hours, Pat A, non-exempt in fund 1000-0002, general fund auditor. Second. Welcome. Is your mic on? Take the red off. How about that? Good. I was glad you guys had a little bit of housekeeping because um, for those of us who knew the very sweet and very kind and soft-spoken Sophia Travis, who had a voice of an angel and a heart of gold, it uh, always choked you up a little bit. But anyway, so she would love the things that, that were agreed on tonight. She just really would. Um, so, uh, and I'm just glad she just loves Cheryl. I'm just glad Cheryl's still working on her stuff. Okay, so we're here tonight to ask for an assistant um, financial director. And while many here may not realize how thin our financial department is actually spread and why this, why this position is greatly needed, I'm going to attempt to explain that to make it easier to understand. The financial department of the auditor's office has been understaffed since I took office as auditor six and a half years ago and was mentioned then quite extensively. The previous auditor had let two financial positions go, which shrunk the department significantly. Um, these positions were never actually added back. Unfortunately, the two previous auditors were, as you know, convicted of fraud and malfeasance and the county's best interests were not necessarily foremost in their minds. My management style and technique strongly adheres to the development and the utilization of best practices in financial accounting, particularly public funds accounting, which is kind of a different animal. This in a nutshell is the adoption of a systematic process of two sets of eyes on all transactions and clear audit trails, which involve authentication of the audit of the each and audit trail of each process by a credential label. This means that all transactions, both payable and receivable, and we use this authentication system of auditing that is mechanically verified by a stamp and initials. So second set of eyes, stamp and initials and date. This is the industry standard, a two-party verification, and it's working well as demonstrated by our great audit results that we've had recently, which is tremendous actually, from the State Board of Accounts. However, once a process is designed, the best practices will only work if they're regularly followed and taken seriously and not dropped. This takes time to accomplish even with trained staff. As I mentioned earlier, when I designed and implemented the system, we were actually already shorthanded. But since then, the 2000 page GASB standards uh, for accrual based audits um, were mandated by the state legislature. This was not a choice that we made. And these changes have additions and, ch and they have changes and additions every each year. So each year we have to go through and vet and see what has changed and all the new standards we have. Um, this was followed up by the um, State Board of Accounts no longer actually doing our audits but hiring um, large outside accounting firms to come in to do these very in-depth audits of this material because they actually could not technically perform these audits. As their auditors were not trained for this kind of auditing um, of accrual-based information and, um, and they just simply don't have the manpower, each audit takes so much longer and is so much more in-depth. They simply looked at the cash on hand as of 1231 of each year. So basically examined a snapshot, if you will, uh, each year. Now the audit is a window of the entire year, plus part of the year of the year before and part of the year of the year after. So it's basically a dynamic audit. It, these audits are horrendous, <laughs> extremely 
lengthy and in depth. So add in funding from COVID related sources, FEMA, ARPA, two sets of major funding with quite different um, sets of rules. And this criteria is voluminous at best. And all this is basically new work since I took office and we were already shorthanded. So this is new work. Um, so the new work added to an already short staff accounting department just has created havoc. Uh, this department has exactly three employees and they are one financial director, one accounts payable person, and one accounts receivable general ledger person. That's three people to do thousands of transactions. And to put that in perspective, just your, with your guys' group, I'll just compare it to your guys' group since you're right here. The county council has one administrator budget person, one administrator assistant, which is Megan's position, one verbatim um, transcriber, in addition to a backup assistant, which is Anita. And now you've added another employee this week that's gonna work four days a week. So just to manage the work for you guys, we have more people and more man hours than our entire financial department. Now that may sound unusual, but that is the case. Uh, so this should seem, this, the amount of time that we have to spend on this and the people should seem tremendously unreasonable to have only three member uh, financial service staff or a cash throughput of over 400, probably close to $450 million um, and will grow and grows each year. Um, with processes that have requirements and tolerances about 100 times more difficult than simple cash accounting that we were doing just two, two and a half years ago. I fear we're placing our finances at risk by being so insignificantly staffed to perform these important tasks. It's truly imperative that we add staff before we have a critical fail. Um, we, we want to add staff so that we do not court risk. Um, it, in addition to to being overwhelmed and overworked, um, things do happen. Uh, for instance, 80% of our staff just had COVID. That meant they were each out a week or more. And that's not just financial, the entire staff, the entire auditor staff. Um, in, a, in a time where you're trying to get the new GASB report done, get the old, get the GASB audit done and keep ARPA going in addition to all the actual accounting work that the counties always have. It, it's just virtually been a nightmare. So I respectfully ask that you vote for us to get this, this additional person. It's a 35 hour week position. This is a person who will not go to conferences. They will not do anything but be in the office actually doing financial accounting. Um, so that's my ask and I'm gonna turn it over to Pri because she is in charge of the financial department and she can answer any specifics and she probably wants to tell you a little bit anyway, um, more in depth than what I'm saying. Hello again. Um, I had the pleasure of addressing you, um, well, PAC and the council um, both now uh, regarding this request. Um, it is truly necessary. We have a lot of work um, and it's continuing to grow. And in order to serve you and the community and um, county government, um, you know, with best practices and providing good information and ensuring we have good audits and for full transparency, we, we need this. I need, I need more help. So um, I welcome any questions. I'm happy to provide any clarifications necessary. Um, I'm just welcome the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments to my right? Yes. Actually, this is an easy one. I mean, we reviewed this position in PAC and as a member of PAC, I support it and I still do. But I'm looking at the position description. Do we not usually actually include the classification on the position description? No, uh, WIS does not do that. They put okay. that in the memo. So okay. that's why I try to include it on when you guys make your motions. For some reason, it's never on the job description. That's interesting, okay. But it's a PAD A uh, is, is what the proposal Correct. is. Yes, yes, the lowest okay. level PAD. Mm -hmm. Um, any other comments to my right? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to, to point out that this um, 
did go through uh, the process that we had set up for WIS. It went through uh, the proper channels um, through PAC. And I, I'm really, you know, we had heard from other organs or other uh, departments here tonight where, you know, uh, we, we just, I, I think we're doing really well in keeping with the procedure on WIS that, that we had set out. And I think this is uh, an indication of that. Um, and I just wanted to make that point tonight. Yes, um, yes, I think uh, that we have uh, so far followed what our guidelines are supposed to be. And I think our guidelines is that we would say that this would be put in line when we look at the budgets as one of the additional, you know, I've supported this from the beginning, but in order to follow what our guidelines are, we, we make a list of all of the new employees that are being requested in all the departments so that we, for the following year. And so we look at that during budget time to say, can we afford all of them or only some of them? And, you know, I, I do support this position, but I, I do think that, that we have to just follow the directions. In other words, you'll have it in, you'll put it in your budget request, but we'll keep that on a separate list of the, something that is brand new and different. We understand that. We understand that that is the process for all new work. Like, like we're basically saying this is new work, unplanned work, work that's been added, not by our choice. And we understand your process. And that's why we're respectfully presenting it this way. Which just to clarify, we are, we're all being asked to approve the position description today, and not an appropriation for the, the position. And that would come in the budget. The, if we can. We did say it's for next year, not not to do it for this right. year. This Correct. is not funding. This is... Questions or comments to my left? Yes. I'm looking at the organizational chart and um, I was looking at the organizational chart and it went away. Here it is. Um, and so this is Pat A, which is um, complementary to what's on the up on the property side, which is also Pat A. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I was just checking on that. Yeah, this is the lowest level accounting yeah. position there is. It'd be the entry level position for yeah. the department. Okay. Thank you. That's that's all I have. Councilman McKinnon. And I just want to make sure I'm counting right. So that this will give you not counting the council administrator, uh, but if you have 14 FTEs in the auditor's office, do you get the same? Yes, because the internal auditor is not part of the financial team. She does much, she, she does across the county, all the papers that we have to fill out. And she, 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 doesn't, do, she doesn't do financial accounting. Right, but I'm just, I'm counting the entire, I'm looking at the historical staffing of the auditor's office. And I, I'm seeing that the auditor's office had 15 FTEs back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of gone, and, and so we're not even back yet to the full size no. staff. No. We're, we'll still be one down from full, uh, the, the full complement that it was in 2008. So I just kind of wanted to make that. Right, the two, uh, the two employees that were removed that have never been replaced were the payroll assistant and the grants person because we combined things. We didn't have a choice, we didn't have enough people. I think Kim was in the department when we did that. So those were the two positions um, and I could tell you who they were, but it would only matter to a couple of you would even remember the names, but down two positions. Yeah. So this would get us back up to one, just down one position. And actually, if you add back in payroll, then yeah, then you'd be at about the same as you were in 2008. Yeah. So, yeah. Because internal auditor- Because that was part- still be there. Right. right, because internal auditor is still how the extra one funds funded from that. But that has paid for itself because we haven't got gigged across the county with people not turning in all their forms. I mean, there's so many different, you know, yeah, we don't have to reopen that we do. So it's really not part of the finance. It's, yeah. you know, we even argued about where that would go because it's a uh, regulatory position. 
Thanks for the historical information, Jeff, as always. <laughs> this is real life accounting. This person will be doing that. Are there any other comments or questions from council? Any public comment on this issue? Um, seeing none, could we have a, is it a roll call vote? We can just, <coughs> all right, then we will have a voice vote. So all those in favor of approving the auditor's request for a new position as uh, described in the motion for 2023, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Shoot, we are getting to the end. And once again, we have elected official salaries on our agenda. And um, I've, I've kind of kept this here as an update um, since it's something that we indicated last year that we would take care to look at closely this year. We've been doing that. We've collected a lot of information um, over the past couple of weeks. Councillor Munson and I um, specifically reviewed data from a couple of different sources um, on elected official salaries um, across Indiana, <coughs> specifically focusing on similar counties in population, as well as uh, the amount of certified levy. Um, what we've come up with um, as an evolution of that review is a proposed salary grid that um, if people are paying close attention to this topic, will remember that, that um, we talked about very early on, I believe, January-ish of this year um, as a, a strategy for placing elected official salaries um, in a grid to, to kind of keep them arranged in a way that um, makes sense and keeps them moving uh, through time in relation to each other similarly, if that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't, but I'm going to put my, um, if possible, if I'm allowed to share my screen, um, it says I can. This is the document, uh, this is an Excel spreadsheet. And what it shows is the base salaries for 2022 for the elected officials um, over which the council set salary. And this, the column then that is column C is a base multiplier, which is um, used in this, in this setup will be used to determine um, percentage of a particular base that is set in the, for 2023 and beyond that each position would get. Before I get any further with this, I'd like to make it really clear that this is a first step at a possible setup for how this would work. Um, we've put in percentages for the different positions and um, I am open to feedback. So feel free to contact me if you have feedback on how I've done this or questions as well. Um, this column then that's column D, um, I went ahead and threw <coughs> a 5% COLA because that's what we've been talking about. It's again, just proposed. We're not, in, um, we're not locking any of this in, um, but using a 5% a COLA, the base salary, which comes from what the base salary for 2022 was for the assessor, um, recorder, and treasurer, then becomes seventy thousand five hundred dollars. 
so as you can see from um, the, the column there, column D, using the percents um, in the base multiplier column, you come up with a base salary for each of the elected positions. And again, these percentages are just proposed and completely coming from me with some advice from Councillor Munson. I'll just put that out there. Um, we're also considering supplemental um, pay for certain positions based on duties assigned to those positions um, that either require or are allowed supplemental pay. And those positions include, as we discussed a lot last year, the assessor with the level one, level two, level three differentiations in um, the credentialing that they have. And those um, are reflected in column E. And then also we've talked about um, various supplemental figures for the auditor for being the clerk for the council as well as the clerk for the commissioners and then supplemental for the recorder and again all of this is just me throwing numbers out um, to kind of keep things nice and round for purposes of showing how this might work and um, feel we can feel free to play around with it um, so the clerk's supplementals come from the election, uh, help me out with what it's called, the election fund. Election and registration. It's, it's election, registration. voter it's registration per diem, right. but the other one is the election fund. Uh, Just election fund, I thought there was another word. Well, it's, it's fund is election and registration. Election. It's, it's, Okay. Yes. There's two election things. Board election board. Fund. Okay. Election board. I'm sorry. That's what it was. Election board supplemental, and then the voter registration per diem. Um, so three positions there have supplementals that um, could be added to the base salary, resulting in the totals over on um, the last column showing there, which is column F. I'm gonna scroll out just a little bit. Um, these are some very quick, very possibly have a mistake in them. So please, you know, be gentle. Um, but the impact then on um, the general fund and other funds, because I recognize that for instance, the surveyor has other funds that contribute to his salary. So, but these are the, these are the, the kind of real quick math on the impact that we would see to the budget. My math on just using these numbers again, thrown out there, um, is that we're looking at uh, under $100,000 if we were to go with what's, what's up here. Um, all for your consideration, I plan to distribute this document amongst, um, well, I'm going to send it to Kim and she can distribute it to counselors to play with at their leisure. And at this point, I will ask Councillor Munson if you have anything to add or um, it, what have I forgotten? I don't think you've forgotten anything. I just hope that our council colleagues appreciate that we went back and forth and back and forth and up and down and around many times just to try and come up with a coherent and logical framework to be presented. And <clears throat> we did this uh, by looking at uh, other counties and those counties did not, that data did not guide us well in any particular way, except to say that we, we looked at counties above us and below us in population, above us and below us in certified levy. And so we were in the middle of those two variables, ranges. And our compensation generally was about 
in the middle. So we thought we aren't doing anything terribly wrong. What we need to do is pay attention to uh, pay attention to the cola and try and make things uh, make sense with the, the supplemental um, payments that we make that really do belong in our salary grid so that it is clear that this is part of part of compensation. So that's that's, 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 how, that's how we got to the numbers that you're looking at. <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm gonna pull that off there, unless you wanted it. Did you want it? I'm still looking at it. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Just send it to us. Yeah, I will send, send it to you. It to it. I am sending it to you. I can't send it to you. I will send it to Kim. She will send it to you. That's fine. Um, mostly what that, what it is meant to be is a tool. So that you can plug the numbers in, work with it. Um, I threw some things in there just as examples and possibilities. Um, I'll take questions and comments. <laughs> yes. No, you, you go, you, you, got, you beat me. I just want to make sure that when we're, we're talking about the supplementals, that we're, we recognize what the state allows us to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't just go in something and say, well, we're going to pay this one more, we're going to call it a supplement. It, it needs to be tied into what we are allowed. I say this over and over again, we can only do what the state allows us to do. Absolutely. So, yeah. And it has to be written into the salary ordinance and that what I put up here would require some. some I'm not saying that I, agree or don't right. agree with the numbers i'm just yep it's an important point to remember we can't just supplement everyone's pay <laughs> um I, I, so first of all i really like the structure i think that's a great uh a great way to do it and um i, I like the idea of the base that applies uh to basically the, the vast majority of elected officials as well as the multiplier i will say that on the multiplier itself Probably doesn't come as a surprise, but I, you know, I support moving the commissioners up to 100. percent I may not that may be controversial, but um, I do think they should be 100. percent And I'm also concerned about how low the surveyor's salary, uh, the multiplier is on this. I, I think in working with the surveyor over the past couple of years, I think I've, I've had a bit come to a better understanding of the enormous complexity of that job. Uh, and in particular, you know, managing the GIS functions of the county, which should only which is, get more and more complex. But yeah, so I would, I would advocate for those two percentages to be bumped up. But that's, I like the structure. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Councilor. So I would like to comment that uh, the surveyor didn't always have the GIS responsibility. So it's got moved into the, to that office without, uh, without changing compensation. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, did I, did I skip a comment from you? Okay, Councilor Decker. I have enjoyed looking at this uh, this evening and also I, I just wanna say, you know, thanks for the problem solvers um, because this has been a problem of discussion since Madam President, you and I came on to council as an ongoing discussion. And I think for a lot of us, We've stomped around and walked off this, but you have not, and I appreciate that. Um, I've made comments in here before about how, you know, wrestling data can sometimes break your neck and, and you get choked on it. And you've not only done that, but you've come up with a solution here that we can now very easily noodle around with, think on, but that is, I think this is a huge step forward on this issue. And I encourage all counselors to, support and, and enforce that effort for something that is predictable and makes the effort towards that. This is a strong start at figuring this question out and not sitting here through this for future years. Any other comments or questions from council? Okay, I will uh, get this out to you in the next 24 hours-ish. Yeah, great. Thank you for allowing me to 
put that up there. This brings us to council comments. Do we have any comments from counselors? Yes. Uh, very briefly, there's a number of us that are gonna be going up to the Hamilton County Jail tomorrow for a tour. So I just wanted to remind the public, we are moving the community justice response forward. Uh, so we're excited to go on that tour and we'll come back with the report. Great, thank you. Yes, Councilor Posse. On that note, of uh, the community justice um, committee, uh, myself along with Councilor Wilton and Councilor Iverson have been a part of the discussion. And I know that was something that was, um, I know people, we are getting lots of conversations. Personally, I had a conversation with somebody. Um, I, I think we all got an email about, um, you know, the concerns. And so I do think that it is very important for our public, for, you know, things that are being done with this committee um, to continue to have transparency and to continue to have public input as we should all welcome that. Um, it is no surprise, and, and I've said it in previous meetings with the criminal or our, our now community justice committee. Um, we at the county have a lot at stake with that. We have a lot of team players on the county, but I will like to say in, in full me personally, that I do feel that our colleagues on the city side are being left out of this conversation. Um, and I do feel that it is very important because both county and city alike, you, excuse me, use our facility as it is now. And so as we continue these conversations, I get a lot of comment and it has a lot of pause for me to think about what we think about what our facilities should look like, um, you know, from, how big it should be to the programs that go in it to the programs that actually are part of the justice um, reform part before a person goes into our facility. So I do think that you know I'm 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 welcoming anybody that you know continues to have conversations with me. I'm more than happy to have those conversations. But I would like to put it out there that I do think that it is vital and I do think that it is necessary for us to have some of our colleagues on the city side to be a part of this committee. Um, you know, the powers that be have the powers to make that happen. And I do respectfully ask that and I will continue to ask that until they are part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Sorry. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank uh, Councillor Crossley for, for making that comment. I completely agree. The city needs a seat at the table. And I, I fully expect the city to have a seat at the table as we move forward on such a major uh, community's decision as moving, moving into jail, the justice complex. Um, and I just want to make a brief comment because I don't want to, I, I want to make sure we at least mention this at every single meeting, and that's the convention center. I was very pleased that, um, that uh, Mr. Spoonmore in the chamber came up with a, uh, an innovative or, or work to broker, I guess, an innovative offer from mm -hmm. the city. Um, I think the, the commissioners, or I, I believe in the, uh, at least one of the commissioners in the media responded something like, well, why don't we just go back to where we were when we were discussing the CIV? I think that's also a great uh, alternative. Uh, we have multiple, we have the possibility of a CIB. We have a nonprofit that would kind of mimic some of the uh, properties of a CIB, but give a little more flexibility. We have the uh, possibility of, or the offer of the city just taking over the operation. We have multiple paths to go, but all those paths have one thing in common and that they move us forward. And so I very much hope that the commissioners and the city will work together to, to continue to move this, uh, this process forward, whether regardless of what I'm, I'm agnostic as to the specific uh, form that this would ultimately take. I just want to move it forward. I want to do, uh, be able to tell the taxpayers that we did with their money that we're collecting the food and beverage tax, what we told them we would. So thank you. And Councilor Brunson. I serve um, at the request of the council on the um, very silent um, food and beverage tax advisory commission, which has not met this year because there have been no requests for uh, funding, but
but the funds have grown month by month by month and none as high as the last month. Uh, this is something that the public is aware of. We, um, we put the reports on the County Council website. So if you are curious about this and, and want to see them, that's where you can find them. And I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Councillor McKim for bringing this uh, issue up I think, uh, I think we should talk about this at, at every council meeting. This is, this is something that the council helped put in place when we enacted the food and beverage tax. And that food and beverage tax may be sunsetted, not by us, but by the inaction of government officials to come to a plan that is workable for our community to expand the convention center, which was the goal of the food and beverage tax in the first place. So we have to we have to stay the course and keep this in the public eye. I will commit to doing this, and I, I know all of you will will join in doing this. We'll just keep talking about it. Thank you. Also Deck. Since this has been added to, as an item, <laughs> I also want to join the choir. And I want to make this point in this August month of 2022 with the General Assembly going back into session in January and all the things that that means. And when I say all, I mean all, that now is the time to move. Um, process questions, other things, questions, all of those are details that people will not think about when they're in a convention center in five to 10 years, they will not think about that. Instead, they'll think about the fact that this is a community where people wanna be. And I wanna point that out all this week, I teach on the campus all this week, I've watched students milling about, I've watched people milling about this square. This is a community where people want to be, they want to come to, they want to stay. We can lead on that like we do everything else. And we've been drawing the tax for it for a considerable amount of time, it is time. Whatever details anyone wants to have, any offer they wanna have, I'll point out the city said, when they came before us, I asked the question, or is every item in here negotiable? They said, every item is negotiable. I take the deputy mayor, Don Griffin, at his word, he's a good person. I've known him, we grew up in the same neighborhood. Great person, I take him at his word. If it's negotiable, we can do it, we can do it. Thank you. Any other council comments? <laughs> I think this is a lively council comment session. I thank you all. Um, and with that, I will say that we are adjourned. All right, thank you.